the picture at the end? Okay, perfect. So uh, we'll head up there if you guys want to cover our front. <laughs> but having said that, uh, it, it's a wonderful to see a chance for all the art, and, and these were the winners of the categories. Along with the certificate, uh, there's a Michael's gift card, and it's for a hundred dollars to come to the <laughs> Okay, first representing Little Cruiser Campus is Colton Altman. Thank you, Colton. <laughs> Next, from Asbury Elementary School, we have Sophia Detain. Next, from Dunlow Elementary School, we have Elizabeth Amaya. Yeah. 
Okay, so it is a school night and there's lots of kids here and I'm glad you got your awards. Uh, you are doing a big five minutes so looking at cookies. Ten minute recess, get some cookies and fun, and then families are going to go home since school night. Then we'll hold the full three and four pages back. Okay. I'd like to make a motion for a ten minute recess. Can I have a second? Second. Roll call.
There were one there. Oh. Oh. Oh, she's here. Sorry. The time is 7.45. We came back two minutes early. Back to you, Mr. Superintendent. Okay. Uh, as we've been doing in the past few months, uh, we've moved our instructional reports earlier in the meeting because it's the most important thing we do in school district. So we have our teaching and learning update. Good evening. I want to give you just a brief update um, of the Algebra 1 offerings that we are doing next year. And this is it's going to be pretty short. These were in the program settings, so already approved. But I want to kind of explain a little bit more the thought process and why we're doing this. Um, again, we focus on learning. So this ties directly to um, one of our principles. Algebra 1, and many people cringe when they hear Algebra 1 is one of the most important on-track indicators of students' future success. Students who do not complete Algebra 1 have a 1 in 5 chance of graduating from high school. And as it currently stands, Algebra 1 is acts as a gatekeeper rather than a gateway to future success. And that's from the Gates Foundation. They did the research on Algebra 1, 1 in 5 chance of graduating from high school. Now, students, if they fail Algebra 1, they could go to credit recovery. I'll be honest, as a high school math teacher, all those years, any student that I saw who did credit recovery in Algebra 1 struggled in every math class after that because they truly don't learn the content. Um, taking a look at the next slide, Algebra 1 is the most, oh, I have it right. Sorry. Algebra 1 is the most frequently failed high school course. And I started kind of thinking about that, um, and we asked why. Well, let's think back to fourth grade. The hardest I think class, probably in fourth grade, is fourth grade math or fifth grade, fifth grade math. math. So a student passes English, they pass science, they pass social studies, they fail math. What happens? They go on to the next grade level. What's the likelihood of them being successful in that next math class? So a kid passes sixth grade science, social studies, English, fail math, what happens? They go to seventh grade. And the pattern continu continues. So we have students sitting in an Algebra one class who may have not passed an or a math class since third grade. And so the likelihood of those students being successful, it's slimmed up. I mean, we're putting students in that situation. So, and I'm not, I'm not gonna read the, all the quotes that I have, but I have the, the statistics from, or the um, information from the Gates Foundation, the research they did. Let's talk about us. Last year, only 20.8% of our students passed the Algebra 1 end of course exam the first time they took it. So those were students in Algebra 1 for the first time, their first time taking it, and we only had 20.8% of our students earn a proficient score. So we need to do something about it. Um, and as opposed to having kids fail and putting them in credit recovery, and then honestly, just setting them up for failure in other math courses, let's be proactive. So what we're gonna do is we are going to take a look at data and achievement results. We're gonna kind of look at, these are incoming freshmen from the middle school. Teacher recommendation, data, and achievement results. And three different categories. The kid that we think can do traditional algebra one, they can be in a one period a day, full algebra for a full year and be successful. Let's put them in algebra one. Well, then we need, what about the kid that we think can do a full year of algebra one, but they just need extra practice during the day with the teacher? You know, let's not send the kid home and have them practice math incorrectly for 30 minutes, because if you do that, it's a hard habit to break. So let's give them an extra period of the day with that expert, with that math teacher, and the nice thing about this, they can get two credits of math. So they get two of their four out of the way by doing an algebra and then algebra lab. And then the other possibility is, okay, who are students that really, really struggle? And these are maybe those kids that haven't passed math ever, going all the way through. And we can break up algebra one into two years. We can do algebra A, covers the 
first half of the content their freshman year, and then Algebra B covers the second half of the content their second year as a sophomore, and then that's when they take their state assessment. So it slows that content down, it allows the teachers to throw in some interventions and maybe throw in that content that they missed, especially from those middle school, those foundational pieces. Um, and it really is a proactive approach for students in Algebra 1 so that we can hopefully not be in the case that the Gates Foundation was talking about with that one and five. So hopefully setting our students up for math success and being proactive. Thank you. More questions from the board? Yeah, what kind of grade of level is this freshman? Freshman, yeah. So, uh, is there just one algebra one teacher or is there multiple? Oh, there's multiple, multiple algebra one. And then we'll have to have different scenarios where we have the algebra with lab. So they'll have, um, you know, two periods of, of math with that teacher and then the algebra A and algebra B teachers. We won't offer algebra B this year. We'll have to offer algebra B next year for the students who take A this upcoming year. What's the effort to gauge and compare and learn from to be more successful? Is it not? Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. So what what are we doing to gauge and compare and learn as quickly from the we'll say more successful classes? There's multiple teachers. Yeah, I think that um, the collaboration, the time that they meet together, taking a look at the data, um, figuring out what instructional practices work, and I, I think that's where you have to have honest conversations as teachers and even administrators with those teachers or what instructional practices worked for your students to perform in this content or this unit versus my students. Um, and so the, I think by separating this out, we're gonna get a truer picture of that because right now we can have fantastic lessons in Algebra 1 and a fantastic teacher teaching it, but if our students have not passed a math class in five years, they still are gonna to struggle to grasp that concept if we can't fill in those, those pieces for them. How quickly do we get that feedback? How, how quickly are we able to capture where the student is in the process? We'll be able to capture as we're going through the year um, with, with assessments. Yeah, we'll be able to grab that data with you know assessments that they're getting. The nice thing about this approach is a student who's taking Algebra 1 for the full year, so like let's say the midterm, that midterm, in all reality, Algebra A and B, it's not easier content. It's just it's just going at a slower pace. So for Algebra 1, let's say that midterm, it's the final exam for Algebra A. So we're not expecting those students to, you know, we're going to water Algebra down. No, we truly want you to learn Algebra 1, so we're going to have the assessments to compare um, for all three courses. It's just working at their pace and truly teaching the content. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that, that a lot of the students have been failing it all along. What are we doing to get Good question. those elementary kids to be able to understand math? Yeah. Before they get to We are in the process. I'm in the process, but I'm going to touch on middle school as well. Um, we are in the process of really looking at that middle school schedule to see what is it that we're doing and what can we do to provide some more time with math. Um, math is difficult and students have a, a difficult time grasping the concept in a 42 minute period. Not every student, but many students have a hard time with that. And then they go home and they struggle. And you know, it, it is taught differently now than when we were in school. And so I think if we're able to provide more time and we're currently looking at middle school in particular. Um, if we're, we can provide more time specifically towards that, I think that's going to help fill in those gaps. Thank you. You're welcome. And then the question I have is are you capturing those kids out there at their end of the year or even now <coughs> yeah. when they go to schedule? Yes. So, schedule. what we did is we asked for uh, teacher recommendation out, right out of the gate for recommendations for, for this year. But I've talked with the high school counselors and um, the admin team. That okay, it's it's it depends on them right now, but we're going to look at I ready again, but then we're also going to look at state assessment. We're going to look at the where the students truly fall on that end of um, the the OST, the state assessment at the end, and then place them accordingly um, where we feel is going to be the best fit for them. And they're all going to get an algebra one credit. So at the end of the day, it's the same content, and that's what I want to be clear on. We're not watering it down. It's just at the pace or the time that's appropriate for that student. Thank you. 
Is that going to be if the teacher decides whether or not they, which option they choose, or does the student and the parents have a decision in that process? It'll probably, when we look at it, it'll most likely be the school placing the student. Um, and there may be some parents that call in and say, hey, why is this happening? And I think once we explain it, this is going to be the best scenario for your, for your child. Um, and, and then we go from there. Thanks. You're welcome. Are we finding fun ways? I think at the elementary level, middle school level, there can be songs and there can be tools. Uh, in my experience, it was a few years back, but I experienced this uh, at growth work, going from middle to algebra and being lost. Yeah. And I lost my kids, and they come home sing song the algebra rules. And I'm like, wow, I wish they had taught me that. So, uh, like, you know, the ancient history here, but are, are we? Um, are we teaching that? Could we be doing a better job in middle school of, of doing songs and things or whatever to, to, to get the freshman school or sorry, the high school and they, they, they have the rules in their head? I think a lot of it comes down to, again, what is best for those students. And this allows for that extra time. Um, speaking with, with math teachers and former math teacher, 42, 45 minute period, it's hard to do some of that. You, and you feel the pressure of getting all that content in for the state assessments, covering it all, and it's, it is hard. So the, and some students don't need it. Some students can grasp that content and move right on. But for those students who do need it, giving them two periods a day, and they get two credits for that, that's a nice piece of it, or really slowing that content down for them is going to allow the teachers the flexibility to feel like they can do that and not feel the pressure of having to get everything done. What was going through my mind was the second period that you have to teach that in middle mm -hmm. school can be choir, can be art, you can teach it creatively, right? Like, to learn rules, learn and just more hands on activities, yeah. more hands on activities for the students, yes. And we've talked about that. We don't want it to become in these two periods, teacher teaches the first half and then the students sit there the second half. And that's not, that's defeating the purpose of the, the time that we're building into this schedule. We want it to be purposeful. I think you already figured it out because I, a question I anticipated was, well, if we're going to start doing two periods for algebra, we're spread out over two years, does that mean more staffing? And the reality is, I think when you consider what our failure rate is, you know, we're putting kids in the same class over and over and doing different things with their remediation. Um, I, I don't know that we've studied that specifically, the impact will be, but if we believe that they're, we're going to get them to be able to be caught up and more successful, it's worth the time investing in resources now rather than trying to tutor our way out of it or try to um, do other ways to, to catch up and just go about it. And, and again, at no point was any of this, these are lesser standards, these are easier. It's really we're accomplishing the same thing. And, and it's, I, I sent a picture of one of the board updates. Kids are like popcorn. It, it's they're eventually all going to perform. It just takes a little different amount of time or a different amount of heat. And, and so that's where we're going to provide more support and resources to make sure that they're successful. Thank you. Our second academic update is our innovation and accountability update. So what was The last few board meetings, we have together walked through the state's formal process for goal setting for the district. I'll remind you of um, some of the terms that we're using, some of the things that we have to be concerned about. The needs assessments and also the one plan. I thoroughly walked through that. I'm going to do that again tonight. So my, our, my update will be brief because I promised you um, that I would tell you about our progress with the principal's discussion. Before we go to that, though, next slide, Nate, please. Mr. Kirshner, you asked uh, for an additional data point at last month's meeting. So we have that together, just one slide. Next slide, please. I guess I can do that. Um, what you asked specifically was our enrollment um, broken down by persons of color. That's what we have up there. The persons of color in our community represent 51%. So what we see with the enrollment is there is a high density of child of uh, school-aged children in our community that we're serving. So our district one plan uh, goals that we've been working with the principals, I have to tell you, I'm really, really happy with the work that the principals have done. They should be proud of the work that they're doing together. And now that has been key. We've had our three principals from our middle schools and our principals from high school work together as a group. 
and also our state elementary school principals are working together in this reading groups with us so that we can go over the district goals. And then what we've been encouraging our principals to do for the last several months is think of their buildings as together one building. They're serving one building. They have to work together to the point where they're so consistent with their work together that we're consistent with what's going on in the building as well. So our three middle schools are really trying to function as, when they're planning and they're coordinating, they're trying to function as one. Our six elementary schools have in the past had many times where they have functioned separately. Now they're functioning together. It's a beautiful thing to watch because they're into it. They've been wanting this for a long time. We're giving them that ability and they're taking advantage of it. So our three goals that we have talked about in the past, I have three sets of slides to show you. I'm going to show you the, the goal that is worded according to how the state of Ohio wants us to word it. It's kind of convoluted. It's, it's kind of you kind of trip over it. I'll read that one, and then we'll go to in a, a slide that is the goal in other words. That makes more sense. So for the first one, we've been focusing on chronic absenteeism. We have to do this, remember, in a three-year cycle. So we set these goals now, and we put them, we basically register with them in the state of Ohio. And then each year, we have to report on the progress we're making towards the goal. This one was about chronic absenteeism. We talked last time our chronic absenteeism has been very high. It currently sits at 36.4% of our students are chronic absentees. Um, that means they miss, for whatever reason, more than 10% of the school year. The, um, the figure that we were, we were focused on was that that ranked us third among Central Ohio school districts um, as far as the highest chronic absentee. So we're looking to reduce that. Here's why it reads, by June 30th, 2027, we will improve the performance of all students in all grades at Gridport, Madison, local to decrease by 45% and chronic absenteeism using chronic absenteeism rate. So here's that slide in other words. As a district, we will reduce the chronic absenteeism rate by at least 45% from 36.4 to 19.9. I want to remind you of what we had talked about before. What we're doing now is we're setting goals not just at random. We're not just taking a 10%, 15%, or 20% approach to improvement. We're actually figuring out where we want to be. That's how you really should set goals. Figure out where you want to be in the next three years, where we want to be, is somewhere around 20%, so that would bring us around that. And now Winchester, better than now Winchester, and just below Westerville City. So that's how we determine the goal, and going back to it, that's how we determine the rate of change, 45%, because we're going from 36.4 to 19.9. Ambitious, and we can do it. Goal number two is about educator equity. Growth for Mass and Local will focus on hiring diverse educators by partnering with HBCUs and all grades for all students to decrease Six, point, six partnerships, uh, increase six partnerships of measure with diverse teacher preparation program partnerships by June 30th, 2027. It's difficult to even say as I, I put it together. That's how the state of Ohio demands that we put it into their formula. In other words, the district will have six partnerships with HBCU teacher preparation programs to increase the teacher candidate pool with an emphasis on giving students access to diverse teachers and perspectives. These are deep partnerships. I've done this before. This is, this is not just what we are, are typically going to a job fair and connecting that way. We actually have to go in with teams and we have to sit down with the teacher preparation program leaders, the teachers and the leaders and the students to see how they are preparing students. We work with them in their classes. We sit in their classes. We figure out what they're learning and what they would need for Burkeport Madison. Colleges love this. They embrace this. It wasn't always that way, but more recently, they want to work with school districts. They want to work with high schools especially. They want to work with us to figure out exactly what they should be doing with their students and preparing them. These partnerships are very good. What we do then, uh, they have to come visit us, and this is a constant visitation kind of thing. They come to us, their students as candidates in college. They come to us before they come to us to teach. So that they're familiar with us, so that there's a deep understanding with who we are, what we're trying to do. And we've been talking with teacher candidates recently. They're excited about our excitement about what we are doing. We're moving a school district. We're moving a community. They do want to be part of that. These teacher preparation programs love that. They want to be part of it too. So that's educator equity. That's improving our teacher candidate pool. The third goal is under curriculum instruction and assessment. It reads this way, a form, in a formal way, Grimport Mass and Local will focus on all of Ohio State test, tested subject areas in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade, for all students. 
<laughs> to increase 20, 20% as measured with the state report card performance index, we spent a couple of board meetings already talking about what performance index is. In other words, we will raise our performance index to 80%. And as a final reminder of what that will do, again, we're looking at where we want to be rather than some ambiguous goal of 10% improvement or something like that. Where we want to be here, I'll remind you to look back to the last one. Our performance index, we want to be 80%. So that would hover us around uh, just above Canal Winchester performance and right around Westerville City. If you're wondering what the next three years would be after that, something reasonable would be it's a little bit a sharper gain. There's more difficult to gain there. We'd be looking at somewhere around a Worthington Dublin performance instead of going up to the next three years, we we go up a couple more spots. That's how we have to operate. That's how we're setting our goals. And again, I want to emphasize how, how impressed I am with the principles and how they work together for these goals. Oh, I should mention, they are also working on, in addition to the district goals, the three district goals that we're going to be working on together for consistency, each of the buildings, those groups I talked about, the six elementaries and the three um, middle schools and the high school, those two groups together are creating a goal that they're going to work toward that's in addition to these goals. They are very excited about doing that and they're working really well for that. Questions? Points? Concerns? So I have a question on the absentee rate. Yes. Um, does that include, when you calculate the absentee employment, does that include um, Excuse the absences? Yes, the chronic absenteeism is 10% of the school year for whatever reason. But the idea there that we should all be concerned about, and we, we understand that these, these situations arise, but we should all be concerned about the time that our students are with the teachers. It really matters. And so if you're wondering what that means in the whole uh, state uh, portal that we have to go through, we have to do a lot of work inside of setting action plans and setting action steps and cr uh, creating um, connections with the funding. Uh, when we do that, we're looking at some programs that the state already has in place that we're going to take advantage of. This is not going to cost additional dollars to go out and get some companies programmed. This is what the state already has in place. They have, for example, a stay in the game program that's been used for very many years by a lot of school districts across Central Ohio. There's affiliation with the improvement attendance through the Freedom Browns, for instance. We have set those connections already. We're going to follow through with those. And we're also following the task force recommendation for, for improving attendance in Ohio. So we're using what's already in place. Again, this doesn't take any additional effort or money committed to a company outside of Brooklyn. We can do this inside. Would you be able to share out here the more um, um, by school, by grade level, kind of what, where we have the biggest problem, what the trend is as far as absenteeism? Certainly. And, uh, and also, one thing I'm really curious about is um, Kids leaving during the day at the high school not coming back. Is, that, is there a trend there or is there not? There is. Let's talk that, about that in the next board meeting. You're going to continue to give me a sign. That's fair. That's reasonable. <laughs> yes, yeah, sir. You're going to be tracking the uh, data from this over the next three years as well. Yes, we have to report to the state every single year to show our progress. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, next, we have our friends from Lead the Way. Mr. Smathers, you introduce our guest. Yes, uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Murphy, and your team. Please come on up to the podium. Uh, this is Lead the Way. Lead the Way has been working with us for a few years. Uh, the, I don't want to steal any other thunder, but one of the best things uh, I can say working with them and working with the high school is. Uh, they're averaging about 40 students. They get about 40 students to graduate that otherwise wouldn't have graduated without their help. Uh, they're going to do it again this year, maybe more. And they're going to talk to you about some of the ideas, proposals, and programs that they're wanting to do and collaborate with us in our school district, uh, not only next year, but in the summer and uh, throughout the school district, not just in the high school. So go ahead, Mr. Murphy. Everybody here as well. Yes. All right, I'm Anthony Murphy. I'm executive director of Lead the Way Learning Academy. I'm accompanied by Ms. Bria Porter. She's our director of business operations. First and foremost, I want to thank the board for having us here. I want to thank all the Evans who've been working with us, the families, the students to make this all possible. It's a team effort. It's all hands on deck. So it's not just 
uh, our program and take the buy-in of you and the support. Uh, many of you have been to our new offices, so it's a time of growth. For Lead the Way Learning Academy, we're at 215 North Front Street. We're part of the Community Impact Center, which is a collaboration between Nationwide Insurance and United Way of Central Ohio. Um, an amazing building. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, check it out. And on top of that, if you haven't checked it out, then I'm sure we're going to have some programming with your youth. Uh, we even saw the art that the students have. We got an idea of thinking about having an art show or a gallery there and showcasing the students' arts downtown. So, um, kind of getting into the meat, potatoes, and things because I respect everybody's time and I know we all have family to get home to. So, Lead the Way Learning Academy is a nonprofit youth development and youth work readiness agency that has been providing youth development and youth work readiness services in Franklin County since 2004. Our mission is to empower the youth with uh, clarity, inspiration, drive, and opportunities for growth. We achieve this through cutting-edge research-backed programs um, and, ser and services designed to provide a profound sense of purpose in every individual we serve. And so we've been blessed to be in Roveport, uh, Madison, since the 2021-2022 school year. Um, during this time, we've collaborated closely with the GMHS staff, resulting in unparalleled outcomes and significantly, significantly uh, contribute to the enhancement of the portrait of the cruiser. And that's a common theme you're going to hear from us, making sure what we do is in alignment with your school district. We're in several school districts from Columbus schools to New Albany, which are schools you saw on that chart that Mr. Berber share, uh, shared. So all across the spectrum, we're in different buildings, but each school, we want to make sure we're in alignment with your program. Mm -hmm. And more so than me tell you what we've offered and what Legal Way has offered, uh, the support is going to read some testimonials from the families and students and even staff members uh, of what they think of the program. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Mr. Murphy mentioned, we've been incredibly successful in our partnership with Groveport, and none of that would have been possible without the collaboration and engagement from parents and families of the students that we serve. Um, and so, like he said, I'd like to read a few testimonials to you all. And the first one comes from a parent, um, shout out to Ms. Blair. Uh, she says that this program was imperative during my son's senior year. It was undeniable that this program gave him motivation, drive, balance, and support. My son even chose Coach Blackwell to hand him his diploma on graduation day, and he completed it by participating in an apprenticeship in the months following. I could never thank this program enough or those with such a wonderful, wonderful heart who run it. It not only helped my son graduate, but it gave him his reason to want to do it for himself. Something I could never do as a parent. For this and so many reasons, thank you to Lead the Way, Groveport Madison High School, and Coach Blackwell for believing in my son and making the impact you did on him as well as so many others. I have another testimonial I would like to read from a GMHS student. They say, their belief in my potential has not only enabled me to embark on this exciting educational journey, but has also instilled in me a profound sense of gratitude and determination to succeed. All in all, Lead the Way is an exceptional platform that nurtures and empowers you to thrive and flourish. One more student. Lead the Way truly empowered me to become the best version of myself, and I will forever be grateful for the doors they opened for me. This organization has been an incredible motivator, pushing me to become better and better every day. Now I have a testimonial from Ms. Clay in the high school. Lead the Way Learning Academy is life-changing, not just for our kiddos, but for teachers that are trying to provide a wealth of opportunity for our students. Proud to be one of their partners. And lastly, Lead the Way has been a very, very positive organization in Groveport Madison High School, and also for my family personally. They have helped many students, including my own children, aspire to reach goals, and they provide support to do so. They build positive relationships with students and make them want to be want to be and strive to be productive citizens in school and outside the community. They help students create resumes for job placement. They help aid in finding colleges, helping students figure out what their interests are and how to apply them after high school. Thank you. So I promise we did not pay anyone uh, for those uh, <laughs> Testimonials, and that was we had to limit it, uh, trim it down. We had multiple uh, other testimonials. So the outcomes uh, since 2021, we have served 300 youth to date uh, through the AMP program, which is Achieve More and Prosper, that's funded by Franklin County Job and Family Services. Through district money, uh, we have been able to serve 265 additional non-AMP youth. So um, our reach has been able to be uh, large based on the funding that we've been able to uh, get from the school district. 
And so when you look at the seniors in our graduation rate, 98.6% of the seniors in our program last year graduated. Um, if they're in our program, we're pushing them, making sure they graduate everything they need. One student that didn't graduate transferred to Focus Academy is still working on getting his degree. He has some unfortunate family situations that he's trying to figure out. Um, as they mentioned earlier, the graduation rate last year was boosted by 10% um, due to the industry recognized credentials that we offer in schools. And we'll talk about that a little later because we want to offer that to all students at an earlier age. Um, the other thing we talk about, uh, career readiness. So when the student graduates, think of it as two free throws if you're a basketball fan, right? The first free throw we have to do as far as our uh, funding goes, they have to graduate from high school. The second one is they have to go into one of the four E's or the traits. Um, and so when we talk about our students in the first year of graduation, we have 91% of the students that graduated from Grovesport that are in one of those five pathways. So we're making sure they have the means to provide for themselves and kind of navigate this world. Uh, over the summer, 64 students from Groveport earned the 12 point industry recognized credentials or also pre-apprenticeship credentials. And they earn those in fields like automotive, STNA, electrical trades, those are opportunities our students get to where they're even picked up from school. So over at the high school, uh, they get picked up from school, dropped off the uh, training facility, and then drove them back home and uh, dropped off at their homes. So this is something that's, uh, because of the funding that we have, we're able to provide this program. Um, just the, the networking students have been linked with Turner Construction, Anderson Concrete, Performance Automotive, uh, Amerisource Bergen, who's now Sincora, Gap, Men's Warehouse, Columbus Fire, VIP Supreme Staffing, which does an STNA program, United Healthcare, and numerous others. So these are the opportunities we're out here seeking for our youth. Talked a little bit earlier about the industry recognized credentials and how important those are to graduating. They're ODE recognized by the Department of Education. And so our first year, we had 39 students go through. This year, we'll be just short of 300 students going through. Um, we're seeking additional funding to serve all students in the high school. So our goal would be to get at least 1,600 students at the high school uh, in the yellow belt and the green belt. The thing that's great about that is there is a reimbursable uh, component to ODE's industry recognized credentials where the district gets reimbursed for anything we charge them. So what we're proposing is a budget neutral program. It's a program that you would give us the money up front, but you would be able to reimburse that once these students earn their credentials. There's also something called IWIP. IWIP is an incentive-based program for any student that's going into technical. And that amount that they need is $1,250 per student. So if we could just identify 200 high school students out of 2,000 plus, um, and they go through that program, it'd be an additional minimum of $250,000 that the district would be able to earn and be reimbursed for. And so to run both programs, we're talking about expanding to the K through eight space. When you talk about careers, it's kind of late in the game to wait till junior and senior year to talk to them. We want to expose them early on. We want to get them excited about education, career days. We want to bring out speakers. We want to take them on field trips so they can get their minds wrapped around all the different opportunities out there. And what we're presenting is a program, the total ticket, $500,000, but all of that can be reimbursed um, to the district from our department of education. And we'll talk to Brittany. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how our program expansion is beneficial to all students in the Groveport District. Um, and I will start by saying I personally am so excited about the possibility of expanding to K through eight. Um, I come from a background of education. I spent almost 10 years teaching elementary school, and so that's where my heart lives. Um, in our K through eight programming, we understand the importance of having families and parents engaged and involved and motivated to participate in their students' learning and growth and development. And so that's where we start is by building that strong community foundation. Um, from there, we're able to use standards-based methods and programming to support teachers in the academics that they're offering students day to day. Um, because each program is customized to meet the needs of Groveport, we would like to be in strong collaboration with teachers alongside them to understand what the needs of their students are academically. With that skill development and academic piece also comes real world context and career exploration. Um, and so being able to expose younger students to what life could look like after high school is so beneficial because for one, it will reduce their anxiety when thinking about what could life look like for me after graduation. Giving them some sort of blueprint or plan to work from provides that North Star so that they know where they could be headed. Um, we are all about long-term success. We want to make sure we are equipping our students with the necessary, necessary skills that they need to thrive 
um, skills such as problem solving, critical thinking, and also SEL development. So making sure that we're talking to students about what they're feeling day to day, but also making sure that they're equipped with the tools and resources that they need to deal with those emotions in healthy and safe ways, um, personally and within a school setting. <laughs> um, jumping into our high school expansion, um, you all are generally aware of what Lead the Way offers, thanks to what Mr. Murphy has shared and also personal experience. Um, this expansion would provide the opportunity for us to level up opportunities such as field trips for career exploration. Um, we would have increased college readiness programs, things like FAFSA workshops, talking to kids about um, what college type might be right for them or what major they might like to pursue. Financial literacy is also a huge piece for us. Um, we need to make sure that our students know how to navigate the world outside of their parents' households. Um, we recently started a partnership with BMI where students have co been coming to the office to learn about financial literacy through programming. Um, and so it's been a really neat experience for them to have those life skills and be able to apply them in safe settings where they're able to make those mistakes and learn from them. We also provide a support system to all students, especially our high school kids. Um, one thing that I'm most proud of is our coaches' ability to instill this confidence and self-advocacy in their students so that when they're struggling in things like Algebra 1, they know how to advocate for themselves and ask the questions to get the supports that they need. I'm going to pass it back to Mr. Murphy to close this out. Thank you for letting me share. So that's pretty much the presentation. It's a condensed version, um, and it still seemed like it took a while, but we're here for any questions you may have now. Um, also, our contact information is here, so you can reach out anytime to find out more information. Thank you, question. Yes, sir. IRC SEALs, tell me about so industry recognized credentials, uh, oh, yeah. so we're talking about <laughs> yeah, Ohio Department of Education, they've got the different career pathways if you go to, the, uh, to, to their website. The thing about our credentials that are unique, they go across every pathway. Whether you want to go into agriculture, leadership, and Lean Six Sigma goes across every pathway. We did that strategically. We also strategically took programming that doesn't require a test. And so when you talk about we're, this is replacing a test for a young person's pathway to graduate, we don't want to give them another test. And so the Lean Six Sigma Green Belt um, was around this time last year, students presented their projects to the board and anybody who was on the board at that time, they came up with some ideas. One of their suggestions was bringing in HBCUs as an opportunity to recruit a more diverse uh, educational staff. So, um, you know, the young people are really getting their minds spinning and we're teaching them uh, transferable skills that they can take on beyond high school. Are you doing some IT certification? We absolutely are. We're working with Tech Corps. So this summer we will be offering a pre-apprenticeship and that pre-apprenticeship offer a seal for graduation, and so students will be getting cop T at A plus and a seal for graduation. And also said what sounded to me like Iowa, but Google decided we were sending them to Iowa. Yeah, Iowa is that I W I P. So it's a program from uh, basically the governor understands the, 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 the importance of these credentials, right? And so they're willing to reimburse schools that are going out and seeking these particular um, certifications. So Iowa is for technical. So it's a reimbursement program for any technical program. The technical manufacturing falls under technical, logistics falls under technical, IT falls under technical, even nursing falls under technical. So any student that were to get that green belt certification, um, it's $1,250 that the school will be reimbursed. So this year um, we have 248, maybe 260 around there, students that are gonna earn the green belt from Roadport Madison High School. So this year we will have exceeded that goal. On the last question, sorry, it sounded like you said BMI was a committee of the body mass index. I don't like to talk about BMI. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was that? BMI is a financial institution. Do you have the BMI credit. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I would just like to say thank you. Um, I have actually been out to the camp. I've been out for last year. I was there at graduation. We had several students in the SDNA program. We had students um, doing podcasting. We had students um, doing electrical. We even had some students doing some human resource work, I believe. Um, and it was great to see the, the camp that we had in the people's house. It was right down the road at our first church. So um, I don't know if we're you guys are doing that again, but definitely let the board know. I know for sure I'll show up. 
be there, talk to the kids, get involved and help them. And I mentioned it's not even just during the school year, there's things also in the summer that they connect with the, the children and the families. So it's not just a during the school year thing, they're with our kids almost all year long. So they have jobs in the summer, they've got additional supports during the school year, and they come back and they're, hey coach, right back in from the, the, the top of the year until they graduate. So I love that whole that whole uh, child framework, I think. We always have to be doing that. So thank you for coming. Um, I love the I live, you know, because you pay good to get it back. That yeah. sounds great to me. So thank you for sharing today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, our next presentation is from Greater Columbus Community Helping Hands. Mr. Smith. It's my pleasure to introduce. Uh, Mrs. Cage, who represents the Great Columbus Community Helping Hands. They have two programs with us, and they've been working with us for a few years. One is stepping off to college, and the other one is mapping your future. And uh, please welcome Mrs. Cage. Thank you very much, Mr. Sanders. I'd like to thank the entire school board for all of your support and for the opportunity to present to you this evening. And thank you, Mr. Sanders, for making it we appreciate the opportunity that we've had to work with your students. Through the years, we have worked with 913 of your 8th and 9th graders, and in that school, our Mac and Future program. And in addition, we worked with 27 of your high school seniors who are currently on starting off the college program. I want to mention to you that in the midst of the time that I was here the last time versus now, we've had a name change, so we're Right, right in from Greater Columbus Community Helping Hands to Helping Hands for You. Because it specifically represents what we do today. I'm going to go a little bit further. Um, oh, there we go. These are our core values that lead our programming that we have implemented in your school system. And I'm just going to let you read that a moment because I don't like reading from slides. Can you read it yourself? Now, let's get back to the meat and potatoes. Our second off college program, we have five workshops that we conduct over a six month time frame. The workshop that we're getting ready to conduct is our last one, which is our career day. That is taking place next Saturday, September, the, uh, September, oh my goodness, um, <laughs> April the 20th, and it'll be held at Whitehall Year High School in their library. And the career day is where the students get to hear and interact with someone from who represents a specific career. In October, the kids get to identify careers they're interested in learning more about, and then we bring <coughs> teachers in to talk to them about those careers. We also look at the landscape to determine what are some of the most popular careers that are going to be um, available to them in the future. And we look at those careers and we look for people from those careers to come in and talk to them also on career day. And we really want to not just let them know that they hear what they're saying and hear what they're interested in, but expand their thinking to let them know what's possible. So the first session that we start with is money in your pocket. That's about banking, managing credit, and we all know that when kids get to college, they're in with credit card offers, and it's free money, and some kids look at that as free money, I don't have to pay it back right now, so they take advantage of the opportunity presented. So we really like to educate them on how to navigate through those offers they're getting so they don't wind up in trouble. We also have information presented to them on scholarships. And we do it in a rather unique way by one source. Um, and we also talk about other scholarship opportunities. But we have a representative come in from the Columbus Foundation to talk to them about scholarships through the Columbus Foundation. Because whoever thinks about a scholarship opportunity through the Columbus Foundation. And so we like to open their minds and give them new opportunities to consider. The next session they attend is called a better, Building a Better You. And that's where we talk about managing your mental health, managing your medical health, and helping them understand how to make those decisions now that they're young adults away from school, away from in school, away from home, that they have the opportunity now to decide when they need to go to a doctor, what kind of doctor they need to choose, and make those kind of decisions. And we're talking to them about networking, which is so incredibly critical. Then we talk to them, the next session is on preparing for your future. Are you ready? And we have a career education panel discussion with four different careers that they get to career paths that they can consider. And then we have a conversation around a college experience where we bring former um, program participants back who get to talk about their college experience. And the students get to interact with those um, participants and learn more 
about what they're experiencing in every uh, phase of a college journey. And we also have a conversation around college safety and how critical that is today. And again, the last session is around the career day, which I explained to you. The survey results that we've conducted, so the results that we've had from our surveys thus far, we've surveyed the program participants. And as of right now, 100% of the participants feel they're ready for here to step off the college. They're more knowledgeable about what to expect. They're more comfortable about that transition they're about to make out of high school into college. 85% of those participants also indicated that the knowledge of how to um, safeguard and manage their mental health has increased. Another 93% said they had increased in, the, in their knowledge around managing their medical health care. Another 73% said they had an increase in the knowledge about various medical and engineering careers. Another 57% had an increase in the knowledge around banking, credit scores, and I've listed there what things those include. And 50% 50 50 of the participants said they had an increase in their knowledge on how to build a resume. And then 76% said they, that their knowledge increased in the various ways to stay safe while on campus. The Mapping Your Future program is a program that we implement during the school day in the classroom. We have five facilitators that are working in the school system right now in, your, in all three middle schools and in the high school that implement these programs. These are the modules that we have implemented thus far. At the middle school level, at middle school central, we just finished up conversation around bullying, around who you roll with, who's in your friend circle. And we did a survey of the students, and we just went over the survey results yesterday. And from those results, all of the students, probably 96% of the students said that they gained a lot from the conversation about adapting to change, bullying, and who's in your friend circle, to the point where many of them have said that their friend circles were not healthy. And now, because of the information and conversations we've had with them, they have decided to sunset some of those friends and to make some changes. And as an eighth grader, that's critically important because they're about to transition into the ninth grade. And if they take some of those bad training circles with them into that ninth grade, then that's not going to present a very good positive experience for them as they make that transition into another school. So having them think about those things today and make some of those critical decisions, they said they felt more comfortable because we had the conversation, they felt more equipped about how to sunset a friend and realize they don't have to keep people in the principal just because they're there today and they recognize that the difference between the healthy and unhealthy friendships. The next thing, the video, the video I'd like to share, while he's teeing up the video before I go to the last slide, I'd like to read one of the testimonials from one of your teachers at uh, Northport Middle School Saint. And this is from Brianna Matkowski. She's She writes, I am writing on behalf of the Healthy Hands program that my SEL class has been a part of for the second semester of this 2023-2024 school year. Melanie Cage and her staff really engaged the students in relevant life topics that students should be thinking about in real life. The program provides insight and guidance for decision making as it applies to real life friendships and decision making. These scenarios have led to deep class discussions around topics that the students are currently experiencing, and I believe the benefits allow for students to make decisions based on what is best for them and not best upon, based upon their peer pressure. The program is valuable to the students here in Grove Fork. While he's seeing that up, I'll read one minutes. more scenario, one more yeah. testimonial. This one is from This one is from Rihanna Prentice. I'm writing on behalf of the It's the same one. Thank you. <laughs> He's got a teeth up now. Yeah. Okay, good. So we asked a couple of teachers if they'd be willing to be interviewed about their experience with our program. And we let them freely say what they wanted to. We gave them a couple of questions, but we let them freely say what they wanted. And here are here's a video of um, some of their thoughts. I'm Simon Davis. I'm an high school math teacher. I teach Alpha One and Alpha Two. I've had the privilege of working with Helping Hands this year. It's my first year with Miss Evron. 
Um, I think it's a truly wonderful program for our kids. But not all of our kids have the resources, tools at home to talk about money situations or how to apply for jobs or how to build a resume, stuff that, that's going to come up in the next few years. Um, our kids do a good job on Tuesday, so when Ms. Hepburn comes in, asking questions, digging a little bit deeper. I think our kids want to know more so that they're prepared when they get out of high school, maybe getting a job or why they're in high school. Um, I would like, if possible, one improvement I'd like to see is maybe a little more technology-based. Um, example of that would be like to talk about writing checks and stuff. Not that checks aren't important, but I think we talk about maybe some online banking. There's a way we can do that because our kids are very technology-based. I think our world today is kind of getting to the point where it's more technology-based. But other than that, talking about careers, talking about decisions they have to make, responsibilities they have to, to come up on for the next four years, three years of high school, uh, it's truly beneficial. And I appreciate Ms. Everett coming out every Tuesday to talk with us. Yeah. That being a future has helped my kids just be better prepared for the future, for the world. Uh, in general, it's helped my kids understand how to open up banking accounts, checking savings, how uh, debit credit works. Uh, so that when they start earning those that money, that salary, they can start saving for their future, whether it's towards a car, college, whatever that may be. Um, it's better helped my kids ask good questions, questions that they may not have even known that they had. Um, and in general, it's just been an amazing opportunity for students to see what it looks like, what finances and money and the world looks like outside of what they maybe just see at home. Also to see what other people are doing with their money, with their futures, and how they are uh, making a better future for themselves. Hello, my name is Emily Tinford, and I teach English in our freshman seminar at Grove Park Madison High School. That's where I came in contact with Ms. Hebron and the Helping Hands Mapping Your Future program. The program is important for our students because it gives them the opportunity to interact with an adult that is not giving them a grade or disciplining them or giving them an assignment, um, but just to practice those interpersonal skills that they'll need in life. And I think that the best part about the program is that Ms. Hebron gets in there with them and she interacts with them and answers their questions and tells them anecdotes and stories. And if they're confused, she walks over to their desk and clears up any confusion. She learns their names. Whereas other guest speakers, sometimes they'll come and just kind of talk at the students, especially in an auditorium type setting. And they just don't respond as well as that. Our students, students today, I think, really uh, respond to individual experiences and feedback. So it's a good experience for them for that. And I think it's just teaching them life skills and again, just human to human, outside of their phones, outside of their Chromebooks, real world positive interactions and feedback. And I just really love how she holds them accountable and lets them know, you know, what she wants them to do and then holds them accountable to that. So it's pretty cool. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Go. My name is Ian Shmondi. I'm in eighth grade ELA teacher at Middle School Central. I have had the privilege of working with Helping Hands for the last two years. Um, it's a beneficial program because Helping Hands comes in and talks to my students about topics that I'm not comfortable talking to them about. Um, the students will extend conversations about Helping Hands after the program is gone for the week, and um, it has helped give a lot of students a goal. Um, it has helped give them some direction, and Melanie is comfortable enough. She will answer any questions that students have, so it is definitely something worthwhile here at Roadport. It is something that our kids need and something they're benefiting from, and I would hate to see Helping Hands go away. I don't know much what to say after that last comment. Um, but I will wrap it up. So it's really important that we continue to focus our programming on what we do best, and that is focusing on enhancing life skills and focus on enhancing the soft skills of the students. And sometimes we take and sometimes 
Okay. <laughs> Sometimes we take those two things for granted and don't realize how much they how much they affect the academic experience that students have, how it impacts their ability to do well in class and school, and all those friendships that they tend to create as they transition from one grade to the next and that's it while they're at school having their school experience. So we really focus our efforts on making sure we're enhancing and helping young people understand the soft skills and those life skills and building modules and programming around those things so that they can be better productive citizens. One of the things that we're doing is to enhance is, is creating a summer program. Slide is gone. The summer program is, um, that's okay. The summer program is called A Journey to Leadership. And it's really going to be something that we do over the summer for in the months, thank you, the months of June and July. And our focus is we, we hear all the time about the reason fights occur because one kid feels disrespected by someone else, or why arguments occur because one person feels disrespected by someone else. So, really, our focus is going to be on helping to understand what is respect. And, and recognizing that you can't, ex you can't expect someone to give you respect just because you want respect. You have to earn respect. So you have to show respect. You have to also demonstrate what respect means to you. And then you can earn the respect that you need. So the summer program, it's a jump to leadership, is really going to be focused around dealing with some very hard topics that we experience today that we don't often get a chance to discuss openly. So that's where our focus is going to be during the summer program with the students. And we're going to check in with them two times during the school year to see if their um, behavior has increased and if it continues to stay good and if they continue to stay out of trouble. I thank you again so much for your time today. And thank you for the support and the investment you've made in the programming and the organization. And more importantly, for the investment you've made in your students. Thank you very much. One more four items. Um, first, we have a presentation from Vouchers Hurt Ohio. Sorry to be held to the podium here. Thank you. I'm Bill Phyllis, and uh, with me is uh, Dennis Willard, the chairman or the owner operator of Precision New Media. Uh, members of the board, uh, uh, we're pleased to be here. We want to respect your time and we'll be as brief as, as possible. Uh, this is the fourth year of um, Coalition's Vouchers Hurt Ohio initiative and appreciate uh, Seth uh, inviting us to come. Uh, so far we've had 274 districts that have paid dues uh, one or more years into our, our initiative. Um, the Columbus area uh, districts that are belonging are uh, uh, Columbus, uh, Westerville, Reynoldsburg, Southwestern, uh, Gahanna, Jefferson, and Worthington, and there are other districts in Franklin County uh, that are considering uh, joining the effort. Um, just so you know, the, the litigation that was filed on January 4. Uh, 2022 is a full constitutional challenge to the Ed Choice Voucher Program. It's not a, a half-hearted effort, it's a full challenge to the constitutionality of that, that particular state initiative. The Constitution requires the state to secure a thorough and efficient system of common schools by taxation or otherwise. The the state is responsible for a thorough and efficient system. It has no business uh, siphoning off money from the, uh, the, the public school system of Ohio. 
um, and into uh, other alternatives. Now, my first encounter with Grove Court Madison School District was back in 1976. That's before most of you were born. Um, Grove Court Madison had a severe financial problem. Um, they exhausted their levy opportunities, and we helped get uh, the legislature to pass legislation that gave Groveport the opportunity to go back to the voters in the December of 1976 to save the district because the state was ready to dissolve the district and put the territory into another district. So I am familiar with financial issues. I uh, spent uh, uh, several years, I, we were involved in the, the uh, we in fact, we coordinated the Duralf case, and I think you've got some buildings as a result of the, the Duralf litigation uh, with that, um, lit or that uh, litigation and the court decisions spawned the school facilities program and the state has had to invest uh, tens of millions of dollars, uh, uh, tens of billions of dollars in school buildings as a result of that litigation. So I'm somewhat familiar with fiscal matters in, in schools. And uh, so that, that was my first encounter with, with Grove Court Madison back years ago. That's probably ancient, ancient history to most people. Uh, it, it was a, a, a good effort. Uh, when we filed the case before the uh, in, in Franklin County Court, um, the state moved immediately to dismiss the case. Now, uh, not only did the judge allow the case to go forward, but allowed the case to go forward with all five claims that we're making. And Dennis is going to be talking about those claims. Um, um, it, it, it's, um, we have so far been successful in every uh, ruling the judge has made so far has been in our favor. Uh, this isn't just a frivolous kind of activity. Uh, some, of, some of the people in the legislature have said, well, they, they're they just, it, it, it's a frivolous case. It, it's not going to go anywhere. I'm here to tell you, it, it's, we're going to win this case at, at all levels because the, the Constitution is on, is on our side. Now, we're going to trial this fall, uh, probably in November. At least that's on the, the court docket um, for, for November. Um, it's a serious case, um, and, and Dennis will probably mention this, but uh, uh, the, the state legislature at the 11th hour of the budget process uh, folded the universal voucher plan into the budget, said it might cost a couple hundred million dollars or uh, whatever, you know, uh, but already we're up to over a billion dollars and much of that money my bank uh, the new money is going to people that already have their kids in the private system in other words it was just taking money from the uh, the school fund and putting it in the hands of private school tuition where parents were already paying that so it's a subsidy now not only that but much of the new money is going to very affluent families in fact uh, uh, any billionaires in ohio are eligible to have their kids to get a, a voucher most of the money is going to the more affluent families therefore the poorer families who can't get into some of these private schools because the tuition is going up you know, how, how fair is that? The lower income families are subsidizing those that are already in the private school environment. This whole thing started out as, well, we're going to rescue uh, children from challenged school districts, you know, poor kids from poor school districts. That's the way it started out. Now, under the universal voucher system, it's a matter of 
uh, the more affluent families. And as one of our one of our claims is that it increases segregation, and it does. Fortunately, it does. In fact, the history of vouchers was one of started by Milton Friedman, economist back in the 1950s. He recommended that the government get out of the school business except to fund vouchers. Some of the southern states picked that idea up and in one county in one state eliminated the public system, provided vouchers so the kids could go to the private schools and some kids couldn't get into private schools. That's where vouchers started. Dennis, I'm talking too long. No, you're not. <laughs> you're, 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 well, I'll just I'll go through the five points, like five counts, very quickly. Thank you so much for this opportunity to appear before you. Um, Bill's right. Vouchers are going on trial in November. Uh, all five counts. Uh, the first count, and we feel all five counts are strong enough, and we only need to win on one count for this uh, program to be, be deemed unconstitutional. And if it is deemed unconstitutional, it means the money is cut off. The, the legislature can't argue with the court. They can't fund this program. And that's what we're looking to do. Stop the flow of public dollars into private schools. We're not anti-private school. We agree with Eleanor Roosevelt. She said, I support private schools. I support private parents paying for their children to go to those private schools. Public tax dollars have no place in, in private schools. Count one is just that. The Constitution is clear. It says that the legislature shall create a single system, a single system of common schools for the common good. This creates a separate system, an unequal system, that allows wealthy families to basically get refunds and rebates for the money they're already spending to send their children to public school. 90% of the new students taking vouchers this year were in private schools last year. That's count one. Count two is, and I don't know how you feel about this, but the state has not lived up to its constitutional duty to fund public schools at a thorough and efficient level. So keep in mind that the line item that pays for these private school vouchers is the exact same line item that pays for public schools. They put them all in one line item. So a dollar more for private schools, a dollar less for public schools. If Groveport Madison is not getting the sufficient amount of funding, from the state that you think you deserve, I would say you seriously look into joining our lawsuit. Count three. Oh, by the way, what's going to happen too? In 1997 and three rulings afterward, the Supreme Court of this state said that a system that is over reliant on local property taxes is unconstitutional. As they start to divert a billion dollars into private schools, there's going to be increasing pressure on local school districts to pass levies to make up the difference. Because you still have the same number of students. You still have the same obligation. So that's unconstitutional. This is the one that Bill referred to. The third count is that this worsens segregation in Ohio. It's just the truth. The fact is, is every student who comes to your school, your doors are wide open for them, wide open. But private school operators, they can apply, and they do apply litmus tests to admission. They can look at a child, a student, and say, we are not going to allow this student in because their family doesn't have enough money. The voucher that we're getting is not enough money. Financial status, academic uh, status, uh, athletic ability, disability, race, religion. These are all things, these are all part of the litmus test that a private school can apply, and they do apply. So a private school, the real, you know, you hear about this choice, it's a false choice. The real choice is in, the, and the power is in hand of the private school operators. I'm not sure where this is going, but let me go back here. Um, so that's count three. Count four is, look at this language right here. This is directly from the Ohio Constitution. It says, that it, the diversion of funding in violation of the no religious or other sect shall ever have any exclusive right to or control of any part of the school funds 
of this state clause, and that's Article 6, Section 2 of the Ohio Constitution. It's right there in black and white. Judge Alito would agree with this rule. It says, no money shall go to religious schools. It's that simple. In fact, and, and you know, when, sometimes they say, well, what were the founding thinkers thinking when they put this together? And sometimes it's ambiguous. This isn't. During the 1871-72 Constitutional Convention in Ohio, there was a gentleman who brought forth an amendment to the Constitution that would allow for dollars to go to religious schools. It was soundly, overwhelmingly rejected. So there's, there's case law here, there's constitutional law here, and, and that's the fourth count. The fifth count is this is a, de a declaratory judgment we're going to. It is a yes, no, binary decision. If we get a court to say, this, uh, Franklin County Common Police Court to say this is unconstitutional, it will be appealed, it will go to the Ohio Supreme Court, but if they just rule one of these counts uh, valid on our part, then they have to shut off the funding. And I'm just gonna go through a couple more things here real quick. Look at this. In the last budget, they increased the vouchers for K through eight students from $5,500 to $6,165. High school voucher is now worth $8,407. Per pupil. By the way, private schools, transportation, bought and paid for by public schools. The auxiliary line item in the state budget, the administrative reimbursement, those two line items are, are for private schools. Private schools are getting money through those. Those are supposedly reimbursement for expenses they incur. But this, $8,407 for a high school student. And by the way, if you want to take that voucher and go to the Columbus School for Girls, good luck. Good luck. So if your family can't put more money on top of that voucher, you're not getting in. That's why the wealthy families are getting a refund and a rebate, and the private school operators are getting their hands into the state treasury, and it's a billion-dollar boom to um, I'll turn it back over to you, Bill. You know, I, I'm not opposed to uh, private operations. I, I've been on a private camp board since 1967. Been on a private college board. I've been on other private boards. Uh, I'm not opposed to private, uh, you know, operations. But the Constitution is very clear. The General Assembly shall secure a thorough and efficient system of common schools throughout the state. And then it goes into what Dennis was talking about, that no sect or secular or religious sect shall ever control any part of the uh, funding for, for schools. So uh, we, we are, um, uh, as I said, we're, we're challenging the, this, uh, this, uh, program you know this program the voucher program never uh, it, it in the start from the start all the way through has never been in a single single purpose bill it's always been crammed into a budget bill where uh, there's very little debate about it and it's always the universal voucher program was put in the budget bill at the 11th hour when no public person had the opportunity to express an opinion on it, uh, just pure chicanery. And yeah, let me just talk about these numbers here real quick. And I just wanted to go over these numbers real quick. But you can see in the last school year, there were 24,320 Ed Choice vouchers. Right now, we have more than 90,000 applications for vouchers. And by the way, the window doesn't close for applications until June 30th until June 30th. So it's already over a billion dollars. As Bill mentioned, what they, when the Legislative Service Commission looked at this, they said this is gonna cost a billion dollars. Senate President Matt Huffman said, no, no, that number is inflated. There's not gonna be that many uh, parents rushing for vouchers this year. Look, you've got like oh, more than 60,000 families. If somebody's gonna give you $8,400, you're gonna take it. You're gonna take it. I don't blame these parents, but at the same time, 
we just shouldn't be offering this to them. This program is unconstitutional. We're going to take it to court and win. Thank you guys so much. Could I make one other statement? Yes, sir. Um, you know of a family that has three kids in high school. Did you get closer to the mic for me, sir? I know of a family that had three kids in high school, going to a private high school. Okay? And one in the elementary grades. And family lives in a three or four million dollar house. A high taxpayer is giving that family thirty-two thousand dollars this year. Now does that Tell you something. I have some questions. Um, and yeah, I'm definitely old enough to remember the uh, doors being changed shut in the 70s of our schools. Um, so, so far, I think you said in the 70s, the uh, property tax base for the school funding was, was deemed unconstitutional. Yet, we still keep going. I think the takeover of the uh, Department of Education at one point was deemed unconstitutional. Oh well. So when I see this is unconstitutional, we're going to win in court. Then why in court before? So I know you're saying, oh, the funds will be cut off, but it seems like a lack of money. Um, and also, it says that the school trust fund will secure thorough and efficient systems. I could argue that's unconstitutional because there are so many not thorough and not efficient systems. And this is probably the pendulum swinging, swinging too far the other direction trying to correct that. So I guess I'm just sharing information and I'm going to go back to your thoughts well, on that. I, that, that. I'm glad you asked that. I think that some, some people think that the, you know, the DeWolf litigation didn't solve anything. Well, there are 1,200 new school buildings, some of them pretty close to where we're sitting or standing. Uh, that are here because of the Dural litigation. Um, the percentage of this general revenue fund went from third uh, of the state going to education went from 34.5 to over 40 percent. So Dural did gain. Um, yes, it drove up the cost, but it's still funded through the, through our land. Well, well and, our land. And, and, and let me finish. That what, what the course said was the emphasis on property tax is the problem. Right. Now, uh, the emphasis on property tax went uh, down for a while, but then uh, the emphasis on property tax now is as high as it was when the Durall case was filed. And it's going to go up as money is skimmed off for private vouchers, there's going to be more uh, more uh, dependence on property tax. I mean, that's the way it's going to be. <coughs> the money would, will have to come from someplace. What about the fact that unconstitutional, 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 yet I, I'm, I'm struggling with the idea that it's going to be uh, deemed unconstitutional and therefore They'll have to stop because so far, the Constitutional hasn't stopped a lot of things. Well, uh, going back to the Durolf case, uh, it was declared unconstitutional four times. Uh, we made gains uh, three of the four times that it was declared unconstitutional. Uh, but then the, uh, the court uh, dismissed the case or released jurisdiction of the case. Uh, however, this the, the, the voucher case is different because what the court said, they, they said to the, le to the legislature and then the governor, go back and fix it. Well, if vouchers are declared unconstitutional, then that ends this. The there's, no fix. There's, there's no fix. There's no, the legislature doesn't have to do anything. It's a matter of, it's, it's an up or down. It's a yes or no situation. And we can pass information. Um, can our board contact you for any additional specific questions as needed? We can pass that out to the full board. I think there's contact information on the handouts provided. Um, this is a, a discussion today, so I think we've had that. Unless there's 
more in the, I think our next board meeting, we can bring this to a vote as a board. Um, but if it's okay, if the board needs to reach out to you, can they do that? Yeah, and I, I should have said, I'm the communications director for this yes. effort. And, uh, and please, if you have any questions, we'll answer everything. We're very transparent on everything we're doing. You can go to our website, Vouchers Heard Ohio, for a lot of information, see what other districts are signed up. Uh, and uh, there's also a resolution on there, a sample resolution, if you want to pass the resolution. Okay. And then the cost per pupil, I think we saw that. Yeah, and what we're asking for is $2 per pupil per year to pay. Obviously, we're going to have large legal bills, and that's what we're asking for. Um, and I will tell you, if you take a look at what that costs you based on your enrollment compared to what uh, the public system is losing, I think it's a very um, minimal amount, and we and um, and, we, and we think we can be very successful with that with that assessment. May, may I ask the treasurer uh, what how many dollars at, on the average you get from the foundation program dollars per people for. From the yeah, state, the state well, foundation, yeah, uh, we're probably close to about 38 million this year, but 38 million on a per pupil basis. Oh, don't I'll buy that. I don't have that in my head right now. Um, in the interim, we do thank you all for coming. I, I did, I think last time we talked about this, some of the things you brought up, we all brought up, some of us brought up 62 about, 64. I'm at 62. We brought up about how um, private and private schools don't have to take all kids or public has to take every child and we don't get to turn anyone away um, we don't get to change um, our application process or anything like that to where a, a child is not picked up and regardless of um, IEPs or special needs we take every child every day where some public, some private schools right now will not take certain students with disabilities they will not take them with an IEP they say they don't have resources that did air quotes um, to support those children so I think it's very I do appreciate you guys kind of pointing that out we did discuss some of that in our last board meeting um, a child that would have if they wanted to go to um, Madison Christian for instance they don't take children with IEPs or are certain IEPs they take and they get to pick and choose and don't give you the rubric on what IEP which ones qualify and which ones don't so our tax dollars are going to schools where it's not transparent in those regards as parents so I do appreciate you guys coming and we will vote on this at our May board meeting yes board member Walsh just one more thing you said you're, you get about six thousand dollars for high school kids the state pays from public money eighty four hundred and six dollars uh, so may I ask one more question uh, how does that work because you know I know some of the schools are tuition only four thousand dollars and five thousand so how do you pay eighty four hundred for tuition only thirty four thousand dollars well the, the point is that uh, for a high school kid, the state pays uh, $8,400 voucher. Uh, so even if the school's tuition is only $4,800, they are going to get $8,000? There's nothing that says they won't. There's nothing in the law that says they won't. And most, when I see most high school, private school tuitions are at $4,800 is normally your K through 8, and then your high school is like 6 to 8 now. At least when the vouchers were rolled out, maybe prior to the voucher piece, it was a little bit lower. But at least that's what I have been seeing online. What I just try to see kind of what's in our area. And, and what happens? What's happening now is the tuition rates are going up. Because of I just want to say thank you for being open to all children. Thank you so much. I mean, that's why we're in this fight because we know Grove Park Madison and other schools around the state are open to all children. Yeah, well, that's our own aim statement. Every student, every lesson, every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it will be to to work that we should have a school for the Ohio come to speak um, on the issue as well, so we can hear both sides of the story. Um, I'll reach out to them and invite them to our next meeting. You can have them reach out to me. Thank you. All right, on to uh, safety committee update, Mr. Spathers and Ms. Collins. Yes, Ms. Premiata Collinwell is our lonely chair committee lead for our district safety committee. 
she comes every time and does a great job, and she's going to talk about our last meeting. Yes, hello. Okay. Um, so our last safety committee meeting was pretty informative. It was very positive, actually. They're all positive, but um, this meeting was very positive. It was attended by Mr. Moser, Mrs. Kimball, and Brianna both is, and Mr. Brown, um, which are middle school principals. And they had a lot of positive things to say. Um, improvement to school safety. Um, we talked about the ID systems that are in the all of the middle school now and how convenient it is, how well it's working. You put in your information and they get the little sticker. Um, even the students who are tardy do that as well. So um, that was a big improvement to school safety and just not having random people walk through the building there, you know, identified. Um, they really there was really a lot of um, positive feedback on that um they also talked about how in middle school the number of fights and aggression are down um which those um sros are making a big difference inside of the middle schools developing relationships with the students there's one sro who does like a popcorn um, popcorn with police. Yeah, popcorn with police um, for students who have been doing really well. Um, and also those students who may not be doing so well, but giving them a positive motivation to be one of those kids who gets to participate on a regular basis, um, which is key with students who do struggle with behavior. Just finding something small to motivate them is always good. Um, Okay, um, the big thing, another big one that they talked about was not wanting or feeling the need to have these all system at middle schools right now. Um, the fear with that, it would create more of a fear. Did you ever say that? Oh, the middle schools are not interested in having any ball system placed into the middle schools right now. Um, and the biggest concern was that they that may create more fear than what is there. So the middle schoolers right now, they haven't had any issues with weapons being brought into the middle schools, like we were saying, some of the concerns at the high school. So that is not an area of concern for them right now. And not wanting to alarm the middle schoolers or change the culture that is there right now. So they um, they spoke very highly about that. Um, really enjoying loving the social workers and the extra cameras in the school. Um, having the social workers has been really helpful. They also talked about this system where they have where students can either anonymously or they can use their name on a computer system and share concerns. If they saw something, if they heard something, um, if they need to talk to someone and they can send it through a computer system and then be called down to the office for that if they need to be and nobody knows that they were the one or why they're being called down to the office, which is I think amazing. My son is a middle schooler. Um, and you know, middle schoolers, all kids now with stitches get stitches, you know. So nobody wants to tell. But I heard a comedian say, snitches go home for Christmas. So I'd like to go home for Christmas. So um, so they did talk about that. Um, I love that idea that they're able to voice concerns and do it anonymously if they want, or hey, I can get my name, but so nobody knows that it was me who said, I heard Sally was on Kate Billy's butt at the end of the day, or whatever. So um, I thought that was pretty um, important. Um, emotional regulation and conflict resolution, I think that that helping hands has a lot to do with that. She did, she was at our um, 
meeting, we talked a lot about talking with the kids, talking about bullying, um, ways to, you know, handle conflict, how do you deal with conflict, all of those things, our kids need to know how to do those things. Um, PBIS is also extremely important, which is a positive behavioral system that we use in our classrooms. Um, PBIS goes hand in hand with that emotional regulation and conflict resolution. You can be the most positive teacher ever, have all these great positive incentives, but when a kid gets to a point where they're ready to explode, if you don't know how to show them how to use conflict resolution or they don't know how to emotionally regulate, all the positive behavior and incentives that you have in your classroom are going to do nothing. Because now you have a kid who is ready to lose it. And what do you do? So all of those things work hand in hand. Um, we also talked about the need for diversity, um, understanding our black and brown children, how they communicate, um, how they deal with conflict resolution. What happens in their homes versus what's being ha what's happening in school? There's a difference, and we have to be willing to embrace that difference, talk about it, um, learn about it, implement. Um, teaching academic readiness, conduct, language, like I said, and setting. So the um, the middle school report was really informative. Um, like I said, the number of fights have gone down in the middle school, um, the safety and security staff are really making a difference. The students love the safety and security staff, the SROs. Um, they have really positive relationships with them, which is extremely helpful. And I think that's the answer to my Do you have anything? I just want to say um, how nice it's been to hear from both the elementary um, schools and middle schools. Um, and hearing um, and being able to experience uh, middle school or elementary ways as well, and the change there um, has been tremendous too. So, um, yeah, it's, we're heading in the right direction for sure. Definitely. The um, I can use this. My son was like, he is in Central. He was like, one day when he got home, that was like the highlight of the day. Like, Mom, I got to put my number in, I got to stay from my But, um, so that. Little things to them means a lot. Like it was little to them, but it was big to me. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because I knew what it was. He didn't know that it was. That was telling me something. But um, I do feel like the middle schoolers do feel like they're in a safe, in a safe environment. So if we could just continue to move that along to high school as these middle schoolers cycle through yeah. and move that on, that would be awesome. For being consistent. So I appreciate you standing through being that parent and being that voice and trying to get others as well as our two board members here that are serving on not just one but multiple committees. Uh, Ms. Bauer, Ms. and Ms. Brown, Ms. Gray. Thank you all, Mr. Smathers, for doing all the hard work in our lovely uh, law enforcement for Madison Township as well as report for showing up and providing me but that's what this is what's supposed to be about and I'm not looking to see the progress. Thank you. All right, students. Uh, Ms. Gray and Mr. Bauer. It was uh, offered in January we went through committees again and uh, those are the two that volunteered. Mm -hmm. On to a uh, student advisory committee update. Um, I'll start. We had two meetings last month. Um, I have been helping out with high school and middle school. And I mentioned already before that our middle school students were talking about ensuring that they saw themselves in the lesson mm -hmm. and really ensuring that we look at some of the national observances um, since they're, as Mr. Wilberts were mentioning, that we're trying to as an equity in our teaching profession. So in the intro, our students thought it would be great to highlight um, some of the other Muslims on their own to share that information throughout the school. 
um, using announcements, working with the principal. So they've done videos, um, they've made their own posters, they've researched their own folk, their own people they wanted to present. And Ms. Dickerson from our uh, comms department who did an amazing job coming out, um, recording them so that's something that they can share amongst the three school districts. Um, we have uh, four from each middle school, um, all girls. So it's really cool to work with the ladies from all three middle schools um, and see the work that they want to do. High school is doing the same, but um, more so on the flex credit. And Mr. Morris did an amazing presentation at our last meeting to kind of let them know, and Mrs. Morris, excuse me, where we were going, what changes to expect. Um, and they're really excited to get in and help promote the Americans to kind of spread the word in their own way to their peers on how to enroll, what questions to ask. So that's coming down the pipe as well. We do have another meeting um, tomorrow with our high school student advisory council. So it's going very well. Students are excited. Uh, they definitely want to change the culture. They want to get the stable going in, um, the cruiser. Um, I guess it's like the cruiser cheer section where they're not like the cheerleaders, but it was really big prior to COVID and they wanted to reinvigorate that, get that back. I think they did it right before spring break and tried to recruit the sign up. So I'm interested to hear tomorrow how that went. Um, I don't know what they, I don't know if they call, call, call themselves the crazy cruisers or something. I don't know what the final name is, but they want to kind of change the school spirit because since some of the things that have happened that were not our students, but have brought shed some negative light, they want to somehow take that power back, which I think is great that they're advocating and they want to take that power back and change the narrative, not what someone else wants to make our school district look like. So I think that's just great to say about the high school and the middle school. So I'll yield to Ms. Gray for any additional things for elementary. Uh, we have not scheduled our second meeting yet. Okay. Um, Mr. Schneider, yeah. should you get this? It's coming meeting? soon. Okay. I had a chance to talk to the principals. Okay, thank you. And if you're wondering any of our officers, at least for middle school and high school, we agreed to do officers elementary or not, but on our social, and there's photos of the students that were elected for secretary, president, and vice president, and they do that in most their peer group. Um, are there any questions or comments from anyone? And they are taking their own notes, so it's taking a little time um, to get the notes to our treasurer. So I want you all to know um, it's a process, but they're learning a lot. And Robert Schultz of Order, they actually have a nice board handbook that I put together. Kudos to Ms. Chris in the office for helping me get those for each uh, high school and middle school officers. But it is taking a little bit of time. As soon as we have those meeting minute notes, they will be presented to the board for a vote. All right, on to our educational trust. So um, this board has put in place an educational trust with three main goals that we wanted to really support and have our own service um, to support our district in meals, um, specialty programming um, that will require transportation, et cetera. So there should be some information in your packet um, with the new proposal we've already got sponsors. I know myself, Mr. Schnather, several of our other partners wish to sponsor with us. We have the date locked in at the links. So I um, just wanted to make sure everyone saw that. We're doing singles and foursomes. The information there, we've got contest. Um, so feel free to share this information. So this is the meeting where everyone's been served notice. And we are moving forward to get our sponsors and get our slots filled so we can do some great things in our district. Are there any questions? So good to go to start pushing. Yeah, I just need to make sure I brought it to the court for a recommendation that I checked with our legal counsel, Ms. Erin, who helped us set up our trust, and it doesn't require a vote, so we agreed we wanted to do some sort of fundraising. We landed on, we we're going to go with the gala at first, and then the loft outing, because with everything happening in the end of last year, we went with the loft outing this June, so here we go. I just, in the agenda, it shows that it's an action item, so um, action to approve expenditures only, but not the advance. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Sorry about that. That's all right. Yes, ma'am. So the expenditures should be very low. Um, as we get them, we will share them with the the, the board. But I may need to. Okay. I don't see a price on the forms. 
What price? What registration form? Registration form. Because it's on the flyer, but we can add that one. It is also on the website as well. But it's on the, the, the form is two pages technically with the flyer, which shows the eighty dollars for the single, and then the four is for each one. Which is this is just capturing the attendees and what they're doing. Correct. Right. That's correct. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then we also have an electronic set of so kudos to our comms department and treasury department. We're getting that done where we can get electronic payment as well. So we're not waiting on checks to come in the mail unless someone wants to send one. That's fine. But we are we are up to speed on making sure we have the multiple methods to receive the payments. If there's no other questions, I will um, the board supports. I'm um, going to do this action item, and I'll be the first and second in the vote. The board supports the Educational Trust Fundraising event and the Anarcho Golf Outing and approves expenditures related to that event. So moved. Second. All right, I have Ms. Gray the first, second, Mr. Bauer. As stated, any expenditures that we will have, we will bring to the next board meeting right now. We don't have any. No, I'm just going to hear the motion. The motion stated the board supports the Educational Trust fundraising event, the inaugural off album, and approves expenditures related to that event. Thank you. You're welcome. May I have roll call, Mr. Treasurer? Mrs. Dunnelberg? Aye. Mr. Bach? Aye. Mrs. Gray? Aye. Mr. Kershaw? Aye. And Ms. Walsh? Aye. The well, motion passes. All right. And our, uh, one more thing, um, we need to appoint our legal counsel. Um, the board authorized the superintendent, the authorized superintendent that the treasurer and our school officials are authorized by the superintendent to seek legal advice on matters affecting the school district. A letter of engagement from board in law is attached. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. All right, I have Ms. Gray as our first and Mr. Bauer as the second. If I could have roll call, Mr. Treasurer. Uh, Mrs. Dottelberg? Aye. Mr. Bauer? Aye. Mrs. Gray? Aye. Mr. Kirshner? Abstain. And Mrs. Walsh? Abstain. Motion passes. All right, and on item six, um, I met with our, our superintendent. We're, gonna... we're, we're still working on this, compiling the information, so we're not ready to report that out tonight. I hope that we would have things ready to go and send it off to the board. 48 hours in advance before this meeting, we just weren't able to accomplish it. So we can move this to our May 8th meeting. I'll just indicate that. All right. It's the superintendent recommends to adjourn into executive session for conferences with an attorney concerning disputes involving pending litigation. As the pending litigation, Walsh versus Groveport Madison Schools Board of Education names the Board of Education and three board members acting in their official capacity. The board hereby declines to invite plaintiffs, board members Walsh and Kirshner, to participate in this executive session due to a conflict of interest. So Second. May I have roll call, please, Mr. Treasurer? Mrs. Dalberger? Aye. Mr. Bauer? Aye. Mrs. Gray? Aye. Mr. Kirshner? Same. And Mrs. Walsh? Upset. Motion passes. The time is 9 0 8. We will go. We don't actually take an act. There is action.
The time is 5.57 and we are doing one second session. Superintendent recommends the report maps and schools board of education approve the consent agenda according to the recommended actions. Second. Second. Um, I request that the uh, number two approve the meeting minutes for February and March be removed from the consent agenda and um, the payment and road transportation number six be removed from the agenda. Consent agenda and voted on afterwards. Thank you. So, uh, all of the meeting minutes, correct? Yes. Yeah. So, two and then six. Okay, real quick, uh, the, first, uh, the consent agenda was Seth and then Libby, right? Okay. It, yeah, okay. Seth and Libby. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And we're moving uh, item two and item six. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. We can have a roll call for the items um, to the agenda for approved certificate personnel, non certificated personnel, and the bus driver certificates. We can have roll call, Mr. Treasurer, on those three items. Mrs. Dalberg? Aye. Mr. Bauer? Aye. Mrs. Gray? Aye. Mr. Kirchner? No. And Mrs. Walsh? No. Motion passes. Can I introduce some new items? Absolutely. Okay, we've been waiting here a little bit. So uh, we're going to have uh, David Hausman come up first. David is going to be our new director of business services. Uh, David has been most recently with Eastland Fairfield and did uh, a, a long stint with um, Whitehall City Schools in many different roles. And I think that the best way I know how to describe him, actually, Paul pointed this for me, that he has a working man's PhD. He has done everything and anything. So, Dave, we're very happy to have you. Would you like the same thing? Yes, first off, I would like to thank the board and Mr. Drew, Mr. Smathers. Um, you know, I'm very excited to uh, hopefully have this opportunity. Um, it's something that you know we've been talking about for several weeks at least now, and uh, it's gotten closer and closer. I've grown more excited. As Mr. Groove mentioned, I've, I've done a lot, and I've been in school business for over 35 years. Um, I was with Whitehall City Schools for 33 in Eastland Fairfield for the last two. Uh, business manager, business operations manager was my official title at Eastland. Um, I have overseen about $85 million worth of new construction. I've overseen another $25 million worth of renovations and additions. Um, just a long list. Being in education for this long, I've uh, done quite a bit in a lot of different areas. So there's a good chance anything that comes in the classified area. I've never been a teacher. But anything in the classified area, I've never been a part of at some point. And, and one other thing that's no small thing that I noticed when I looked at your resume, that you were also, in addition to all the facility things and the classified work, you were over transportation as well. I was. I uh, started out, I was um, a maintenance trans transportation supervisor way back when, and the director of the facilities and transportation, director of operations. Um, and oversaw transportation. I've done routing. I've um, managed bus drivers, mechanic, maintenance, um, all the drivers, aides, coordinators, and not that I am advocating for this, but I've driven bus too. Um, I've had my license since 95. Welcome. Well, thank you. Yes, yeah. we're excited to have you. I'm sorry, what was We're that? excited to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next for our uh, Director of Communications Community Rates Relations, we have Ty Deverboys. Good job. And I've been working on it. Uh, Ty comes to us most recently. He's been at Flight Safety International, which does training for NetJets. He was Director of Communications uh, 
in marketing at Whitehall, also uh, Columbus Clippers, Director of Marketing, Mount Carmel Health, Digital Marketing Specialist. I'm excited that he is, he brings both very much the vision and view of a school, traditional school communications director, but also a ton of private sector experience. So Ty, glad to have you. Welcome to the team. Would you like to say anything? Well, thank you. I very much appreciate the opportunity. I'm really excited to get to know this community and just provide communications as a service, not only to our school families, but our staff as well. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Were you at the CSC at Mount Carmel? Yes. I set up the visual signage for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I knew you were yeah. Going. Yeah. I, so as Jamie said, I, I've worked in professional athletics. I've worked in healthcare. Spent nine years at Whitehall City Schools, took a slight detour to aviation, now I'm back in public education again. But yeah, at Mount Carmel Health, I was in their in their marketing department. So thank you. Yes, thank welcome you. to the team. Thank you very thank much. You. So you're not gonna do get to do this often, both both of you. But uh, you start a new job tomorrow morning. And I expect to hear bright and early, so I'm going to excuse both of you to go ahead and go home. And I'm going to be here for the rest of the meeting. Don't be used to this. But thank you for coming in. Thank you. Does that include the other directors? No. Okay. They're not on the payroll yet. <laughs> Okay, the first one um, about this would be. Uh, Treasurer recommends Grover Madison Local Board of Education. Treasurer recommends the Grover Madison Local Board of Education approve minutes for the special board meeting on May 7th and the regular board meeting on February 16th. Hello. Second. Second. I just wanted to comment that uh, in the special meeting where uh, Mrs. Gray um, requested that um, uh, special meetings that didn't have anything but executive session not be recorded or uh, promotion and disclosure. So, I just want to bring that to the board. I mean, I'm sorry, I mean, we may not have ended up yet. I just, that was one of the glaring things. Well, that the seven, six, two. Okay. 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 Which board meeting? I think that was the 13th, wasn't it? March 13th, the regular? Can you, uh, okay. can you say what did she say? I didn't hear you talk your mom and What it was, yeah, you quoted it again. What did you say? I said that she was misquoted and that she had stated that she only wanted um, the, board, the meeting, the special meeting, not to be recorded if there, only if, if there was uh, no other business um, besides the executive session. I think that's what's wrong. It's on there. So, the recording session motion added that special meetings shall not be recorded. It's only to open in our executive session and then close. Yeah. Right. yeah. That's on page two of the bottom. Yeah. I guess there should be one. On March, is that under number eight? Oh, you, you guys stated you wanted to go to March 13th, so that's where I went to. And I scrolled down to page two, and it's at the bottom. Motion by Libby Gray. Um, that is that discussion item eight, Madam President? Yes. yes. So I need a minute to say board meeting minutes, board member Walsh presents a letter emphasizing the necessity for improved and comprehensive board minutes, highlighting the absence. Uh, it doesn't have anything on here about Ms. Gray making a motion on these. Which, which one are you looking at, Kathy? I'm right about discussion eight. I'm looking at the 13th. Yeah. Then it says action 2, 24-168. Yes. Recording the session before being added that special okay. meetings shall not be recorded if only to open 
enter executive session, and then close. The motion was by Libby Gray, seconded by John Kirshner. That motion has not been my meeting in the next There's two different versions of the minutes, I apologize. Um, the one that I've gotten that's on the mindset guy on here is or March 1st. What do you mean? It's on board docs, is what? January 3rd, on February. I was thinking 316. It was printed 316. This says right here it was March 15th. I printed it on that day. And I have it, it says that uh, March 13th is a board meeting, generated by Tony Lamb on March 15th. That's what I see on the board box. And that's what we're voting on, right? Correct. Right. Right. Is that in your power? Uh, those aren't the meeting minutes that I have. I have one different one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
What was your last comment? I'm sorry, I did not hear you. I said that we have to choose us to send a copy of the recording. That's all I said. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Who will number roll call? Mrs. Dowler. Aye. Mr. Bauer. Aye. Mrs. Gray. Aye. Mr. Kirshner. No. And Mrs. Walsh. No. Motion passes. On to the next item. Payment in the left. Superintendent recommends the Newport Madison School Board of Education approve payment of the loop, transportation reimbursement. The Ohio law allows for public school districts to determine the impracticality of transporting resident students attending schools not located within the district after consideration of a number of factors. Upon that determination, the school district is permitted to offer payment in lieu of transportation to the parent or guardian. The transportation department has completed studies and residents in affected areas and will be offered pain in lieu for the 23-24 school year. The initial list of families being offered pain in lieu of transportation is attached as executive content as it lists students' names. So moved. Second. All right, I have Mr. Bowers. First, Ms. Gray, second, and comment. On um, questions. My question is um, Have we transported to Grove City Christian before? There is. In past years, like last year. I don't know. Possibly. Do we have any other students? Not sure. I mean, um, in this in the past, we did not. No. Okay. You, did you hear his response? He doesn't know. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So if there's questions like this, I would also ask that way the superintendent and may have time to respond to ask these in advance um, so they can look into detail if that's the, the need for getting the board member. At this time, we'll have to call Mr. Treasurer. Mrs. Dadelberger? Aye. Mr. Barr? Aye. Mrs. Gray? Aye. Mr. Kirshner? Yes. And Mrs. Walsh? Aye. All right. Motion passes. Once the superintendent is in there. Okay. Um, super, the business services update. I think we're going to tag team and fill in on this little bit. I'm first going to ask Community Bus uh, to come up and give their portion of the presentation. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. I want to thank uh, Mr. Stathers right off the bat. He came to our driver meeting this morning and bought donuts for 100 plus drivers. And not only did they appreciate that, but he also recognized uh, three of our drivers for a very uh, dangerous situation that they handled professionally over at the Excel campus at 4500. Um, if you can't imagine how much they appreciate somebody from the administration coming down. He also uh, acknowledged and recognized the driver who was involved in the March 11th head-on collision with the Jeep. Very severe accident. So thank you again for all that. Uh, we do have uh, the rodeo coming up on April 20th. We have 16 participants. Mr. Smathers also recognized our rodeo champion and trainer, and they'll be out again there on Saturday. Uh, as long as it takes on Saturday practicing. Uh, these are new drivers who aren't aware of this type of uh, competition, and it, it really serves to improve their skills. Other than that, my, my report stands as submitted. We're, we're flush with drivers. We're certainly going after drivers who are calling off. Uh, we're terminating drivers who uh, are no-call, no-show. We, we have a brand new, we used to have, it, 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 you had a no-call, no-show three days in a row. Now it's three days in a calendar year. So we're, we're Forcing our standards. Our DVR audits are paying off where the um, supervisors and the uh, onboard instructors are um, using the digital video equipment to check for cell phone use and any other uh, you know, skills that they should be uh, employing on the bus. And, and uh, if they're less than uh, adequate, we have post, uh, post uh, uh, review training. And that can, concludes my report. Is there anything that anyone would like to ask? Where and when is the April 20th or yet? I'm sorry? Where and when? Is Newark. It? Newark. It's, it's at the Newark High School and Union Rodeo. And it's at 8 o'clock. And it goes pretty much all day. 
So, and they even have potluck lunches and stuff like that because depending on the number of participants, they expect about 60, sometimes they have up to 100. And uh, it's, it's just a great event that focuses on, of course, the necessary skills. How many are we 16, 16 which is tremendous. That's, that's four teams. Yes, Terry, I, did, I just want to offer you a chance to share with the board your sponsorship for the Educational Trust Inaugural Call Family. Tell, tell me what you just said. <laughs> you're you're going to help us out with the call family. Oh, that's this yeah. won't let me get out of it. She, she already said how many you know four sips are we going to have the whole bit. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Very much appreciate that. Thank you. And one last thing, working with Adam is a joy because our, our bills are being processed. We're going over all the callbacks. I think we're almost done. We do have the, I just want you to know, I'm not sure this with you, we do have the start of the year from uh, August done. So we'll be, we'll be handling all of that. And then we'll have that done. And that's a big thing off of, all right, all right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I would also say sometimes um, there are good and bad symptoms. And, and we live through the bad, for some time with canceled routes and lane routes and not being able to fill things like that. I, I can't tell you how refreshing it is to hear we're flush with bus drivers and now we can start going after the low performers to make sure that not only do we have all the spots filled, but we're filling with the highest quality. And, and I, I think the symptom, the positive symptom shows that routes are running, routes are on time, people are there. And it's, it's really only things we have in our control, like flooding or traffic or, or things like that that really cause delays. And when that happens, we're communicating to our families, so we're, we're on it. That it's a different world than, than where we were at other times. So I'm happy to share that. Uh, Nate, okay, the business update. So a couple things I'll share. Um, a few more pictures, if anybody likes to see pictures. Uh, we're gonna look at construction of the new, go ahead and go through Nate. So the top left is the metal building where we'll do the bus repairs. You see some inside work directly uh, below that and concrete, so that's progressing uh, underway. Uh, on the next page, you'll see a boiler, our hot water tank uh, being replaced at Sedalia Elementary. Something I'll point out, you see the gentleman bending over doing the installation, that is our maintenance. A lot of districts don't have the staff and skill set to have things like this done. You're calling outside plumbers in. We save a lot of money having highly skilled people on our maintenance staff who can do work. So I, I think we should be proud that when we do these things, we, we look to do everything we can do internally first using our maintenance staff. I have a um, question in that picture. Yes. <clears throat> Is that like from the burning? Yeah, some people have to do it. That's what I was going to ask. What in the world happened to that? Yeah. So we put a hole in it and it looks like it was spraying it. Is it spraying? I didn't know if it was like black from fire or something. I don't know the answer to that. Isn't the, isn't the hole an intake for the pipe? Is that how they do it? No, that's not. That more like, it's not even a, a well cut hole. It just hole. looks like smoke right through here. Yeah, that area. Just, I'm just curious. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> kind of scary. Was it bad? Did it bad? Oh, it was a fire. Oh, that hole, what I thought was a hole is the, um, is the label. Uh, initially, our April direct certification found 47 new students. So we have a total number of direct certified students at 3,851. And, and even though this is a different number, direct certification means automatically qualified, identified through that. But we, we also, um, if you look at our numbers, uh, free and reduced, we have 4272 free, 510 reduced, although they're not treated, free and reduced of the same more. The most significant thing that I want to, I don't know if I've shared this before or not, we believe that we are going to be eligible to move to universal free lunch at all of our buildings which we'll do a couple things one is um the, the estimates that we're looking at right now we think it'll actually 
with increased participation, it will bring more revenue into the food service budget. And just so you know and everybody else knows, the money spent in the food service budget has to stay within food service. So it's not, you don't make money and transfer to the general fund and things like that. The other thing it does is 155000 in um, meal debt that we have. We still need to take care of what's out there, but if we're universal free lunch, we should not have meal you know, debt after that because everybody would be able to eat. So that, and, and, and the, at that point, we would know that anybody who wants it or will have access to at least free breakfast when they come in the morning, free lunch in the afternoon, and we are, uh, we do some feeding programs in, we're eligible and available to do some feeding programs in the evening. And we're, we're going to have a summer feeding program uh, for our summer school program. Oh, all right, Dad. Last year they did this too, but the state rules changed where last year was forty percent of your kids had to be a certain pre-reduced, where only two were going to qualify. Well, that went down to twenty-five percent. So uh, when they down twenty-five percent, now all of our going to qualify. So that's what we can do now, and it's actually like. Last year, it was going to cost us money each month if we did this. That's why we couldn't do it. Now, though, with the preliminary numbers that we just got, we'll actually, our fiscal trust will be actually in the green each month, even by doing this, because the whole reimbursement from the federal and state will actually be in the green. So it's a, it's a, it's a no brainer kind of. So um, I have this brings up an interesting point. We, um, in order to be deemed lactose intolerant and not have to take a milk, grow milk away, that currently we have, the student has to come with some type of doctor's excuse or something, is that true? Um, I don't know if we require doctors. I know we have many dietary things that we address. I, I don't know the answer if it requires a doctor. Maybe yeah, for the future, if you could advise yes. that. It, it, I, as a parent who has a child that doesn't, we don't return anything, they just know that. They can just say they are. If she did, yeah, they, they, they witnessed the milk issue, so they did not make her take it. Yeah, our parents just tell us. Yeah. And we let, we let we let David yeah. know. Okay. Well, from the FDA perspective, you know, now with these laws, they say we're supposed to have to have on file, and it's like the FDA forces <laughs> forces milk on kids sometimes, and a lot of them are tolerant of that. So I didn't know if we had a good program to offer them options. We yeah. offer them options. Okay. Yeah, we, we all sorts of allergies, whether it's yeah. yeah lactose or, or certain gluten, grain, yeah. peanut, things like that. We're, and we provide, uh, I know that Dan provides alternative meal schedules to meet the, because all the dietary restrictions have to be there to meet the caloric and, and, and number of carbs and number of protein. And then there's a whole point system of that. Um, but I, I know that there we provide all sorts of accommodations to meet student needs for allergies and other things. We also do share tables, so if a student takes something that they're, they're not interested in, they can set it on the table, and another kid can have it. Thank you. I think that's all I had for a business services update. Unless you have any other questions, any other questions for me? Okay. To the transportation bill. Okay, so back to our agenda. Okay, number two, diversity engagement human capital, Dr. Green. All right, hello everyone. So, thank you, Nate. Uh, so I will give some updates regarding certification staffing. Uh, so we've had some new hires which we've approved tonight. Uh, we will likely have about five more, fingers crossed, by the end of this week. Uh, so we're looking to fill a number of positions. So we have some administrative positions. Our uh, Sedalia principal position is currently open. Uh, we're doing level one interviewing this week, as well as our secondary special education position. Uh, for the coordinator, we have uh, candidates we're doing against first level interviews. That work very closely with special education and then our teaching and learning as well for those positions. So we're hoping to have some candidates that will move forward to second level and then final level with our superintendent, deputy superintendent, and hopefully for the May agenda we can have some additional candidates for those positions. But uh, as you know, the 
There are some vacancies with our IS positions uh, within the district. We have about uh, 18 total positions across the district, but most of those are IS positions. So we're not alone in trying to fill those positions. My counterparts have had some of the same challenges. So we're working to get a lot of those filled. We've had a number of career fairs we participated in, about a dozen so far this spring. Uh, we have another one that we're doing, uh, Kent State, uh, Mitzi, Boyd and I are gonna be doing that at the end of this month, uh, and a few other uh, local career fairs. So we're looking to get some good candidates from those uh, career fairs, and, and then also people that apply through Apple Track as well. So uh, just kind of keeping you posted about those opportunities. Uh, classified, uh, Mr. Smiley, what are we going to do? Okay, so we have a few positions that we just, again, hired for that you approved for this evening. And we have some openings uh, that have just also come up, I know as well. I know that just kind of talking to our treasurer this evening, uh, we're likely to hire any new people for the end of the school year since we're kind of wrapping up just a few weeks left. But we're hoping to plan for next year. And then in that planning, uh, we have a classified job fair that we're partnering with uh, Canal Winchester and Whitehall School Districts. And we're planning to have that uh, June 5th from 4 to 7 at the Canal Winchester School District is hosting us. So we hope to get some people for some of these types of positions across all three districts. So we'll keep you posted on that. Again, that's June 5th, 4 to 7. Uh, at Canal we trust. You can go ahead to the next slide, Nate. Uh, teacher recruitment, I just talked about that. So we saw probably over 100 students across all the career fairs that we've attended so far. Uh, we just have one more left. And then Mr. Smathers went to Ohio Northern with uh, Jeff Altman. Uh, so we're looking, again, to have some great teacher candidates. A lot of folks are not in those IS roles, they're more uh, pre-K through five. Um, we have some people for music and art, but not IS. So as you see those IS candidates, we are working closely to get them interviewed and hopefully move forward into offering positions. So uh, DE Council, uh, we have our next meeting coming up tomorrow evening. I know Ms. Zellenberger hopefully uh, still wanted to uh, join us for that. I know she's participated in several of our meetings and I'm inviting all the board if you're available to come tomorrow evening, we will be in the room next door from 5.30 to 7. Uh, we'll have food provided, so look forward to having a working meeting, but also some food uh, to discuss. One of our featured events that we have coming up the Celebration Cultures Day on May 15th at 5.30 to 8 at the high school. So we're planning that day out. So uh, we hope to, to have some rich conversation and actually, like a, again, a working meeting with everybody over, over food. So. Uh, if you are interested in participating, please feel free to stop in. Uh, but that's all I have as far as updates. Oh, one other thing. I, I did connect with uh, PeopleWorks, and I will have hopefully some data to share for next month's meeting. Uh, she has to do some customized reporting, so I would like her as our rep. So we'll have some of that for, for the next one. Thank you, Matt. Any questions? It's very helpful to be in me as well. I would encourage you to work with her to do some great work. Yeah, we're always looking for new, new members, so please, if you want to show, please feel free to come. Thank you. Thank you. Superintendent, I'm sorry, lost my place. Superintendent recommends Groveport Madison Schools Board of Education approve the purchase of 1,650 Chromebooks and licensing for the 2024-2025 school year. And the reason I switched from our previous uh, hard copy of 6400, I switched over to the electronic version of 51950. So that cost has been reduced by a little over $100,000. Hello. Second. Can I have this for you first, Mr. Brown, second? Any questions? Mr. Song, you're going to give us a quick review of what's going on and, and the reason for the change. Sure. So um, with the release of the new processor that goes in the, the new Dell model of Chromebook, the prices of the old models dropped. And so we've elected to stay with the, it's the same model we have now. And I don't feel that there's a $100,000 jump in power that we need for our students in the foreseeable future. So we're getting the same, this is actually the same Chromebook we got last year for $40,000 less. So um, what do we do with our old uh, Chromebooks? Um, we either 
we have a couple options. We can try and sell them back to somebody that wants to take them for parts. Uh, we do keep a certain amount of them on hand in case we need them for testing and, and loaners when we had too many broken devices. Um, or we send them out to recycling and we get um, cash back on scrap. So um, do you have an idea of breakdown like scrap versus selling? We don't generate, by the time we get rid of them, we, there's only about a, a 20 to $40 value in the right. device. So we don't get much back. Like um, if we send them out, it's going to cost more to, it's a break even scenario. You know, someone dealing with getting rid of the device for us is the cost of the device most of the time. So what is it, if you send them to recycle, what do you mm -hmm. get? We get, I don't have those numbers off the top of my head, but we get a certain price for um, plastic, a certain price for the screen, but then we also have to pay to deal with the battery because the battery has chemicals in it. So um, in this purchase, we're not necessarily dealing in this agreement, we're not necessarily dealing with the disposal mm -hmm. of the old units, correct? correct. And the, the old units, so we're, we're purchasing a quarter per year. The old units are still serviced by Google for another two years, I think. So we don't have to get rid of any devices immediately. We can use those for spares, parts, um, loaner devices, testing devices. Um, when we have uh, career center students come over, we don't provide them with a the device, but if they're in our building for some reason, we have to provide them with one. So we've got, we've got those on hand as well. And um, did, were there bids provided? Yes. Were there competitive bids? Yes. Okay. Uh, from I got multiple bids from four different companies. Okay. And was everything dealt? No. Acer no, I, I had a couple of demo units from Lenovo. Um, I had quotes from Acer. Um, we elected to stay with Dell because that keeps all of our, our parts streamlined. Um, some of the Lenovo units we feel would be harder to repair. Okay. Um, and also the other unit was a touch screen, which, I, which I, we may want to purchase for a staff, but um, the repair costs on those touch screens are exorbitant compared to. So it was, um, was Dell below bid? Dell was not, the, well, this was not the lowest bid because it does have a three year um, accidental break protection on it as well. And what happens? With that. So, so with so for for four years, each device gets one repair provided by the company that we're buying the device from. So, um, and that works out to I think about eighty dollars a unit is is that cost. And so, for, we get four we get four repairs one a year per device or per student, depending on how we apply it. We've been applying it per student. Keep it equitable. Then can you share a ballpark? I, I know we talked about how many devices we also internally repair a year. Mm -hmm. and, and so having similar models, we stock battery chargers, batteries, keyboard screens, mm -hmm. and, and some of the, if there's an efficiency from that as well. Absolutely. So we, our big things are keyboards, screens, batteries, motherboard. Motherboard is going to be $200. So we're getting our $80 back if a motherboard goes bad. Screens are in fifteen twenty dollars, depending on how many how many you have to get. Keyboards are pretty expensive. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but at this point in the school year, we've got seven thousand devices, and we've had a sixth of them have in, in a breakage incident on them. And when do you expect your next round of purchases? A year from now. <laughs> What is your average lifespan for a unit? Um, it used to be it used to be three years. Google has changed the support for these units until 2028, 20, I think. I think it's four, I think it's five years now. Did it last that long? <laughs> Did they really last that long? <laughs> no, but they'll be support if they do make it that long, they'll be supported that long. Because the other piece of this is that we have to buy a license from Google to get them into our management console and right. and Google kind of dictates how long those models they have a lot of control over 
the Chromebook units uh, across the board and across manufacturers. So did we do an RFP or how did we go about making We did not do an RFP, but we did do multiple bids. Thank you. Well, thank you for showing our students. We're still saying, well, we appreciate that. Thank you, guys. There's no additional questions or comments. If we can have both on Mr. Treasurer, please. Mrs. Donna Berger? Aye. Mr. Bauer? Aye. Mrs. Gray? Aye. Mr. Kirshner? Aye. Mrs. Walsh? Aye. Motion passes. And Mr. Treasurer, whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm bringing it up. March. We're in April now, so this is March. Um, and as you go through the cash cash flow statement, like we normally do, um, we got 3.5 million uh, in, in our uh, state foundation, along with another 356,000 in March. Um, and then we got about 700,000 in other revenues. So revenue coming in was 4.6 million. And then, of course, we had personnel uh, services and then the retirement insurance, uh, supplies and materials, capital outlay. Another object total expenditures were seven million, um, so again about two point four million dollars um, to the to the negative, but that's okay because uh, we got we were supposed to get our payment in from the county March twenty eighth, but of course that was March twenty ninth was Good Friday, so we finally got our big payment in April first. So and I'll, I'll show you that later because it's 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 really messed up now and it'll be year to year, but um, I'm happy with the payment. It was a little more than I more than I thought it was going to be, but I'm very happy. So that's just kind of the monthly breakdown. The charter receipts shows the same thing, um, the revenues, um, and then expenditures, obviously. And again, you know, personal services, employees, and insurance, 78% of, of the March expenditures. So this is the <coughs> change from prior year. So this is, you'll say, holy moly. But again, what happened was last year in March, we got our, our, our big payment um, of 18 point. Nine million uh, this year. It's going about twenty million. It's about a million more, uh, which is good. Um, my fire forecast I presented in November. Um, this is a little bit higher than I thought it would be. So it's great news. Um, and again, the same thing. Also, the next line down of two point six million. The same thing because there's when you get your uh, your your payment, it's both those line items. Um, we did get a nice little boost. Uh, you can see there, one point one million um, on line one point oh three five. Um, and I want to do a, a shout out, and I put, put it here, but shout out to um, Jamie Scott. She's gone. But um, my office and Jamie Scott, along with Enos, we worked really good also with, with Mitzi, especially about ex excess costs and stuff like that. I think we really honed it down this year, and we got about an extra half a million dollars this year that, uh, that we didn't get last year. So I just want to do a shout out to, to my office, um, to the people at, you know, their assistant treasurer, and, and then their offices also. Is that work. Work. No, this is tuition excess costs um, for like our kids or tuition that maybe one of our kids is in a different school or something like that. That's money that should be ours. I, can't get it on here. I know I didn't put it on the savings. It's not really savings, it's just extra money. It's extra money. So so that's that's nice. Um, and uh, so as you go through this, just the difference between last year and this year, you go down 3.01, it's just salaries again increase. Um, and then you'll see that uh, purchase services was actually negative 465 compared to, to last March. Um, and so, and that was, um, the, our tax settlement again didn't hit because there is some purchase services in the tax settlement. Um, so all that will hit next month. And, and then- We're 1.1 more than you expected. Not, not about 1.1 million more, it's about, about half a million dollars more than- No, I'm not counting on you, you're 20 million being up a million. Oh yeah, about up a million, yeah. What was that? Property taxes, sorry. Yeah, property, sorry about that. Yeah, property taxes. And they do have to let you guys know that it shocked me, but we are actually, with the increase in property taxes that Grover had, we're actually at the 20 mil four, which I didn't think we'd get there. We were there. It was that it was that much of an increase. And our voters, of course, didn't see all that increase, but then they saw some of it, but then somebody else wouldn't see some of it. Uh, yeah, so we are on the 20 mil four for residential. 
Um, uh, yeah, other stuff. Um, Can you explain that? The, 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 20 mil, the 20 mil tax floor is what you what what growth work people pay in taxes. So that is it's a calculation based by the Franklin County Auditor's Office. But it, with the property tax increase that everybody got, we were at I don't think we were 30 mils or close to that. We we're actually down to the 20 mil floor. And so that's and that's the lowest it goes. Now state legislature is trying to do a 15 mil floor now, you know, but the 20 mil floor is what the state law is right now. Which again is good going from 30 mils to 20 mils. But yeah, other than that, any other questions? Again, some of these numbers are just because of the, the foundation payment will hit in April. So I'll see these same numbers in April, but the other way. Um, my next item, savings update. Um, actually, yeah, I didn't, there's really no changes. I didn't put any changes up here. Like you, my, my last couple changes was from CBS. Like you said, they're all grabbing it from August to December. So hopefully we'll have it by April and it'll all be one big hit. Um, but yeah, I did not put that in the savings update. Though, so. So nothing really changed on this from the last month. And then the third thing that's online is just the master, uh, on my uh, treasurer's agenda, is the uh, Meta Master Services Agreement. That is just like our, our payroll system, our payroll system, and you know, and all of our back, backlog systems that we need to have. Obviously, they're on payroll and to do student services and stuff. That's what that agreement is with Meta. Have you operated the Meta before? No, uh, you got you got to have um, you got to have a back office log with the meta and stuff. So like you say, software and support they support that. So if we ever run into a problem, and like there's other companies out there that are a lot smaller, but I think Meta has 200 probably school districts in the state use them because they're pretty good in pricing. And obviously, everybody in Central Ohio uses them. You got some small ones out in the rural areas and up north. You have like their own little <laughs> A site, I think it's called. But yeah, most everybody here uses Meta. Yeah. Yes, so I have one motion and it's approval of the master services agreement with Meta. Uh, the treasurer recommends the Grover Madison School Board of Education approve the master services agreement with Meta. Second. All right, Pam is ready to start. Mr. Robert is second. Mm -hmm. Any additional questions or comments? No, we'll use your roll call. Um, Mrs. Dalberger? Aye. Mr. Bauer? Aye. Mrs. Gray? Aye. Mr. Kirshner? Aye. And Mrs. Walsh? Aye. Motion passes. Superintendent recommends that the Groveport Madison Schools Board of Education adjourn to the executive session for the purpose of preparing for conducting and or review negotiations or bargaining sessions with employees concerning compensation and other terms and conditions of their employment and to consider the employment, promotion, termination, or compensation of a public employee or employees and to meet with the board's legal counsel to discuss disputes involving the district that are subject to pending or imminent court action in accordance with the Ohio Revised Code 121.22. Second. Second. Right. And Ms. Gray is first, Mr. Allen second. If we could have a call, Mr. Treasurer. Mrs. Dottelberger. Aye. Mr. Bauer. Aye. Mrs. Gray. Aye. Mr. Kirshner. Aye. And Ms. Walsh. Aye. Times 1040. And there's no action afterwards. Is that right?
time is 12 22. We have a discussion if you want some comments and other pieces if anybody has anything. Real quick, but um, is our audience awareness awareness on that? Do we work with three bubbles? Are we aware of that? Yes, we do that. Yeah. Um, and we signed a contract with the Awesome, thank you very much. Boys say, girls say, you all are here. Um, we're going to put a bucket of the meeting. Got a chance for the time information we're looking for. Uh, the Legion is looking for transfers for boys say, girls say. Um, a real quick analogy. Uh, we've had, Rose Court has had, I would say, a disproportionate amount of. Uh, boys have government voices, and we have a lot of the same way. I think some of you might know them, maybe he was a board member, he was probably about 83. He didn't have his father, uh, one of the guys on the sister's father, and he didn't have the grades to make it, and he went to the voice state and was elected governor, and uh, because of that. And that's just one example. There's many examples. Um, they do a quick pop up with state, uh, state um, not candidates, but parties. And uh, the governor comes down and they call the different judges that come in and they actually elect one government and operate it. So the governor is side by side with the governor of the state of Ohio. It's a, it's a really great experience for leadership for people. And um, that will probably be Anyway, good. Okay. Uh, so, lots of that. We have uh, April 22nd, the Department of the Church of Asia We have a facility for four hours. Uh, yeah, there's some, there's some dates. There were four hours. The last activity when people were here with the different kinds of choices. I think I think it's next Wednesday. I'll, I'll, I'll send that to um, A little shop of horrors this weekend at the high school. This time of year, there are lots of horror ceremonies. So keep an eye on that. Excited. It's, it's tiresome, but it's a lot of fun. A lot of good and your things. Oh, and Libby was a winner of the Yeah, and uh... As a student, uh, to, to, I wanted to uh, remind everyone about the um, upcoming deadline, May 15th. I share it with the Morbisters, and I have a paper I'll get to hand down uh, for the uh, fair performing uh, groups. Our May 15th is their deadline. The deadlines for uh, the um, other programs are October 30th. I was hoping we could have our house and I talked about that at a meeting somewhat last month I think um that could enter which would be pretty good at that point Mike also for the um capital conference uh student achievement fair this month but they can enter the project if oh, they've got okay. um, the um, assessment and right, the project that they've done. Plus, we might be able to do another another one that I was told today because of it being under budget. So, what is the fair performing group? Uh, the fair performing group deadline is May 15. What does that mean? They um, they will choose amazing performing groups across the state to perform during the student achievement fair. Um, which is during the Capitol Conference. Uh, so, so cheerleaders, choir, band, orchestras, percussion assemblies are included in that. So hopefully we can have something like that. would be great. Yep, it's on our radar. We'll, we'll make sure those submissions happen. Thank you. All right. Um, we have, we will do a special shout out to Adam Reed over at Independent for uh, the record that I had to so support. He's very helpful. A students report out there, as well as the uh, local um, city of Columbus police officers that team each other to support our students and families. So that was great. Um, 
last month with the school, um, we weren't there. We did have our president gave us out for you as a part of the CEO that came to visit and spoke with us and actually stayed at our school. So we were there in the beginning of our and um, it was great to have them there. There is also a carnival on May 5th at Multiply um, Church. Um, five nine two of the road, so we several um, three things it was for families to participate in tonight, and then the third our today is on the So I want to remind high school also the Leo Lucas scholarship, which is the black pockets for OSBA. That scholarship has been extended into May. So I can send somebody um Mr. Sorbo for our black pockets community for our OCA. I wanted to make sure that got out to my high school. If there's nothing else, we can continue to adjourn it. If I can have it first. Um, so, so. <laughs> All right, I'll have the video first. Who who was first? Libby. Libby and then John. I guess I'm second. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so yeah. Mr. Treasury. Mrs. Dalberg. Hi. 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 I have a first. I'll stop. stop. Yes, I All right, so we get a whole more.